Okay, this is Tanya Pearson interviewing Nina Gordon and Louise Post of the band Veruca Assault for the Spy Smith Collection's Women of Rock Oral History Collection at Smith College on January 12th, 2015 in West Hollywood, California? Valley is Village. Is that where I am? California, Valley Village. I'm very <laughs> close. <laughs> Studio City. Studio City! Studio City, California. Um, thank you very much for doing this. Very appreciative. Um, yeah, and like I said, Nina Gordon and Louise Post, this is your life. <laughs> and so, <laughs> like to start with um, childhood, just, you know, where you grew up, what it was like, um, relationships with parents, siblings, just kind of a general synopsis and I don't know who wants to start. Wanna take it? Yeah. Um I grew up moving around quite a bit. Washington DC, Boston, Madison, Wisconsin, New York, Chicago. Um and my parents were were hippies. <laughs> I was born in nineteen sixty seven and my father was um a law student and activist and um we moved around a lot. He was super, he was teaching law in um, Madison, Wisconsin, and, you know, was was part of many de demonstrations. We lived there, you know, at a university in 1969-70, so it was a pretty volatile time. My parents were super into music. I remember all of the records they would bring into the house, like when the White Album came out, you know, they would bring it home, play it incessantly. Um, so we grew up with with great music, a lot of you know, Beatles, Bob Dylan, Jimi Hendrix, uh, Stones, and um, and there was always music in our house. My father played guitar, my mother sang and played piano, and um, music just figured heavily into everything everything we did. Um, I had sort of a it was a. It was not the most stable upbringing. Um, like I said, we moved around a lot, and my parents' relationship was sort of rocky um, from from the beginning. So um, music also played, you know, a super important role in my emotional life, and you know, making me feel safe or. Um, you know, comforting myself, and the same was true for my brother, who's also very musical and is also in the, mm -hmm. in the band with us. Um, but, um, you know, my parents separated, got back together. Um, things were always kind of shaky there. Um, but I don't know, um, I don't know how much you want to know. Yeah, no, no, that's good. Um, yeah. And then you kind of mentioned something that has been a common thread with all the musicians I've been interviewing is um, I was going to ask about your musical brother and just, yeah, kind of how you, music was a part of your life from an early age. Mm -hmm. You said both your parents yeah. were into so, music. So, yeah, we were always singing, you know, every road trip we took, every, every, everything we did, there was always music playing. There was, you know, I, I have really strong memories of, you know, Cat Stevens playing and um, Donovan and, you know, setting the table and dancing and listening to music. And it, um, and my, my parents kind of instilled in me this feeling of, you know, music being one of the basic needs for mm. survival. You know, it was sort of like, you know, your physical health, shelter, food, family and music. I mean, those yeah. were the things that made, made life livable, you know? So, um, so it was, it, that was a huge, a huge part of, of our family life. And the thing that connected us as a family was the music. Um, and you know, it was kind of a, a bond in, mm -hmm. in our family. And, um, anyway, then, um, you know, grew up, lived in New York, um, Played instruments, like learned to play guitar when I was young at summer camp, but didn't really do much with it. Um, took piano lessons, didn't really want to do the work, you yeah. know. But I, all I wanted was to sing and to have other people accompany me. I didn't want to do the work to learn to play guitar <laughs> and learn to, you know, theory really scared me. Music theory did, and um, 
and I uh, so but all, so all I wanted to do was get other people, my brother, um, friends who played the piano, get other people to accompany me so that I could sing. Um, and I started writing songs at an early age and loved loved the feeling of you know just sort of pretending to have some sort of advanced emotional love life at, you know at a young age like yeah. 10 writing love songs <laughs> about things that, you know I knew nothing about but I'd heard songs you know about um, and then um, and then I moved to Chicago I did some I went to high school there I did some musical theater musical theater at camp and that was a huge part of who I was as a young kid um, performing in plays and singing and you know Rizzo in Greece and um, you were Rizzo? I was Rizzo. No. <laughs> I was Rizzo. I wanted to be Sandy, but I was Rizzo. And, um, and uh, yeah, and so then I went to high, I, you know, in high school, I started doing some classical music training, singing, um, and went to college thinking I would major in music, um, but ended up majoring in art history and French literature. Um, and started a band supposedly in college like we came up with a name we got okay. all the people we got a practice space we never did anything or played a show and I tried to learn to play electric guitar I had an amp I had a guitar that my brother had given me and my brother basically taught me chords via the phone mm -hmm. he was we were in different states and he would get on the phone and be like how do you play we got the beat by the go-go's and he'd be like okay put this finger there and put this finger there <laughs> and I would just write down instead of knowing the names of the chords I'd just write down the positions of my fingers um, and very much like today yeah very much <laughs> like today nothing has changed um, and uh, and then got I mean I don't know how how up to date we're far now we're good can I s Yes, Skip. switch okay. to Louise, please. Okay, yeah. So we'll switch. <laughs> Childhood, go. <laughs> no, I'm like, ah! It's never done two people before. I think it's going well, though. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, um... I was born in 1966 in mm. St. Louis in a um, hospital which is no more. Oh. <laughs> I leveled it. No, I think it's actually just shut down and looks really eerie when you drive by. It's, it's an no abandoned hospital? Eerie. I'll probably go there. <laughs> Check it out. Um, anyway, I tried to look up there and imagine what room it happened in. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, and I had an older brother and sister and a younger brother. Um, and uh, similar to Nina, my parents were on rocky soil for some, for most of my childhood, and they split up when I was eight. Mm -hmm. And um, prior to that, they, they actually prior to me, they met in a choir, a summer choir in St. Louis, and um, and so music was a big part of their relationship, and mm -hmm. and uh, and then and they they were both singers, and they both sang with me um, from a really young age, and I used to do um, we used to, my mom played guitar, and we would sing at family parties. Um, she taught me how to sing harmony, and that was the oh. best thing ever. It was the best thing, even as a small child. Like, we'd sing songs like Yellow Bird and Four Strong Winds and yeah. these sort of um, classic folk songs, and and um, and it was so much fun, and that's a great, really nice memory I have. Um, and I sang with my dad, also, really more musical numbers, and um, he loved Cole Porter. Mm -hmm. He loved classical music, but he also really loved Cole Porter, and... He loved musicals, and um, they began taking me to musicals and to uh, musical to um, to opera pretty early, um, and and so that just music figured heavily into my childhood. And my big brother and sister were they had all the cool rock records. My parents yeah. not so much, but my big brother and sister had gave me like. Um, David Bowie and Abbey Road, um, and the Beatles at Abbey Road, um, and those were, and I think, Abbey Road and Ringo Starr's solo album were some of my, couple oh, of my yeah. first records, and and um, and I just grew up listening to to, to rock, and um, I think probably even back then I fantasized about starting a band, and but um, and then. Fast forward to, um, I guess, 
you know, I was always doing musical theater and then into high school similarly. And I, I started a band with a friend and we did some songs for uh, for a talent show. And that, those were the first songs I wrote. And I read it wasn't like an R&B band. Well, I did that too. Oh, it was two separate <laughs> yeah. things? Okay. I did a talent show with a friend of mine named Jenny who is still a musician, still playing. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, and I also did a, I was in a band with my brother. We were called Prodigy. Mm -hmm. Or the prodigy, which is the established one. The prodigy. I think it's the prodigy. The, okay, we were yeah. prodigy. Okay. <laughs> did I ever tell you that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, we did the Go Go's. I sang "Our Lips Are Sealed," mm -hmm. and another song, maybe "Vanity Six, I think. And then I was in another band, like a full-on, very popular band in St. Louis called Vision. Oh, <laughs> Prodigy and Vision. Okay. <laughs> and. Um, but don't they both sound super keyboard based? Oh, they yeah. really do. Oh, like someone's playing a guitar yeah, somewhere guitar. in that band. <laughs> I don't think there was a guitar. No. There were like three keyboards. Yeah, yeah. there were like there three. Were. Yeah. Was um, there a real drummer? There was, was a real it the drummer. Button? Okay. These were really good musicians, right. actually. But um, but yeah. So and I've been playing piano um since I was little. I used to like sleepwalk downstairs and just bang on the piano mm -hmm. because I wanted to play it all the time. I later decided that it'd be boring to be on a piano bench my whole life, but, um, but I, yeah, I love the piano, so I play keyboards in the band. Oh. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I play keyboards. <laughs> and Singer then, slash keyboardist. Oh my God, <laughs> um, but anyway, so, um, so yeah, and then um, I went to college and a friend of mine mm -hmm. gave me a guitar. She gave me her acoustic. Or she, maybe she lent it to me and she gave me some sheet music to the love boat. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> theme music to the love. How do I not know this? And she taught I've never me. Heard this well, you know Maria. Yeah, but I never knew that. <laughs> and she gave me, um, and she taught me how to play the Ramon song, Chinese Rock. Mm -hmm. And um, is that what it was, Chinese Rock or Chinese Rocks? I can't remember. I thought it was just Chinese Rock. Chinese Rock. Yeah. And so those were like, well, I didn't actually learn the theme of the love boat on guitar, mm -hmm. but I did learn the Ramon song. And you know, I have really, even from the get-go, I had no use for anyone else's songs but my own. Yeah. I was bored by them. So I started writing songs, like right out of the gates. Like, here's a guitar. Oh, I, I get to write a song now? And it was really just like that. That was the beginning, and it never stopped. Um, well, until I had my baby, and then it stopped for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but prior to that, it never stopped. Um, and, um, yeah, and then so, but I didn't really do anything with, I didn't play music. I guess I started writing songs in college, and I did some open mics. I did that. Mm -hmm. And then, but then out of college, I was in theater, and I had written a few songs. I mean, I probably, I remember a friend of mine had a cassette. I may have written a lot of songs, actually, none of which I would, I, I would ever want to see the light of day. Mm -hmm. But, um... But I would rather, I would put off homework for, you know, any kind of schoolwork to write music. I mean, it was just the greatest excuse to not do anything. Like, no cleaning, no homework, no final cramming, anything. Yeah. And then, um, that was my favorite thing to do as soon as I found the guitar. And right out of college, are we out of college yet? Um, yeah, well, I have one, one question before that. Yeah. So, um, you went to Barnard, you mm -hmm. said? I went to Barnard. And Tufts. Mm -hmm. Art. Nina was art history, mm -hmm. oh. and you were an English major? Yeah. Um, but it sounds like your interests before that, and it's kind of funny that you both did, well, I haven't interviewed anyone who's done musical theater or anything like that, and you both no, have, like, a history, yeah, have that as a background, so that's kind of, I don't know, it's funny. Um, but did you, and you seem to be very passionate about music, so... Were you, I mean, why did you major in those things? Was it an option for you to, like, go to music school, or was it just kind of a hobby and you thought you would choose a practical occupation or something so and do music on the side? Well, in my case, my dream was to be in a rock band. That was always okay. my dream. I have cassettes of myself, you know, at 10 saying, I really want to be in a band when I grow <laughs> up. I want to be a singer in a band. So that's what I wanted to do most of all, but I didn't think that it was necessarily possible. Mm -hmm. And by the time I got to college, I was taking academics pretty seriously. Um, I, I wanted to do music, I definitely did, but it was more of like an extracurricular thing. I was okay. doing, I was singing some classical music in college, I was in an early music ensemble singing Renaissance music. 
and um, I didn't really know how to be in a band. It wasn't like, um, it just seemed like, no, I have to do something practical, maybe more academic. And I wasn't interested in music theory, so I yeah. wasn't going to go to music, I wasn't going to go to Berkeley, and I wasn't an instrumentalist. I was writing poetry on my own and making up songs in my head, and but, but it just wasn't a concrete mm -hmm. um, way of life. It was sort of like, you know, a dream. Yeah. And it wasn't until Louise and I met that it became something I, I actually was going to pursue and put my put my whole self into and leave my job for mm -hmm. but um, but art history and French literature was what I loved and and yeah I was sort of in a more academic mode secretly you know re you know reading Rolling Stone and buying all my records and you know fantasizing about being in a rock band but thinking that that was out of reach yeah, yeah. Um, and just this has nothing to do with anything do you do all of the artwork like did you do I've one. done I've done a lot of it, and my brother has done a lot of it. She did oh, okay. Money. Yeah. Did and money. did you do the most recent the the album cover? Jim did. Oh, Jim no did. kidding. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah, yeah. see some of your doodles on Instagram, yeah. and I'm like, has Nina been doing? All I do this basically if you if it's if it's cute and sweet and sort of primitive mm -hmm. looking, it's probably me. Oh, okay. If it's like actually you know rendered perfectly, rendered perfectly and more professional, it's probably okay. Jim. Yeah, yeah. Was just, that has nothing to do with anything. That yeah. was just my... Yeah. I just wanted to know that. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and yeah, what about you majoring in English but loving to perform and play music? Well, the the aforementioned band, we won't need to say the name again. Um, it's kind of funny, were, though. They were, <laughs> they were um, going to try to make it on a national level when I was mm -hmm. about to go off to college, when I was at that age. and. I, I, you know, I was pr pretty interested in doing that, and my mom really pushed for a college trip back east. Mm -hmm. And so we visited, we, we basically visited the Seven Sisters. We didn't go to Smith. We went oh, visited okay. Mount Holyoke. I mean, who we went to Mount Holyoke and you didn't go to Smith. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> I really don't know why. Um, but we, maybe it was just the way the trip was routed. Yeah. But we, we did visit Mount Holyoke. We visited Wellesley. We visited Barnard. And then we visited Princeton because my dad had gone there. And my mom had gone to Sarah Lawrence. We didn't visit there. My mm -hmm. my stepmother had gone to Barnard, and my big sister, my stepsister, had gone to Barnard, and she was really an idol of mine. My other sister went to Mills on the West Coast, okay. and I I thought about going to California, but I fell in love with New York, mm -hmm. and um, and that was that. I mean, I she I went to dinner in the East Village with her, and then we went on, went on a train up to Spanish Harlem, which at the time was a lot sketchier than it is yeah. now, and. We got a bag of potato chips and some orange juice and vodka at the lo at the corner store, and we went upstairs and like had the funnest night, and yeah. and that was that. I was going to Barnard. I mean, Barnard was like next to Mount Holyoke, where you get like milk and cookies in this beautiful dining yeah. hall in Wellesley, which is of course it's completely enchanted and and incredible. Barnard was like kind of a dump. I mean, you know, oh. <laughs> and not in terms of the campus itself, but like. The, the setting, the setting, and the um, and the, the cafeteria mm -hmm. um, was you know they basically look like chairs from a child's preschool or something, oh. and um, really grumpy people serving food. <laughs> and, and anyway, I just I, I I just loved it there. So that was that. And then um, I actually did audition for a band in college um, that was hilarious. I answered an ad in um, in the Voice. And I went down somewhere, like somewhere around 42nd Street, and there was, <laughs> which already sounds great, <laughs> and there was like a guy, no, I think I was in the band. They, they asked me to be in the band, and there was a guy who played the guitar, um, a real preppy white guy who played guitar with two strings out, like the B-52's guitar Oh, player. okay. And um, the songs were questionable. Anyway, I got out of there, but, um, but, but yeah, I, I really... Um, I loved reading. I loved literature. That's and I also loved art history as soon as I was introduced to it. But I kind of came on board too late, and there wasn't mm -hmm. enough time in in my tenure at Barnard to to finish up that to do a double major. So yeah. I ended up just being an English major, and um, and I just figured there was I, I was also I got into poetry in college, and um, that became a big a really a big highlight for me at Barnard, and I, and something that you know, led to what we did, what we do together, and songwriting, and it all played together. But thank God that, thank God I did have those four years to not 
be doing what we do now. Yeah. I feel like we really, need, I really needed that to grow up. Um, yeah, I mean, unless you have any crazy college stories <laughs> um, that you feel like you need to share um, to be archived forever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I am always really interested in the after graduation years <laughs> because it seems like everyone just has a, you know, you graduate from college and then it's like, oh God. Yeah. And, you know, the people I've been interviewing just kind of, so far have just kind of wandered around and then started a band. I'm not sure when, how long after you guys oh. graduated that you met or like what happened in between your... Oh, well, bef just to jump back for one second. Okay. Um, as it happened, Suzanne Vega went to Barnard and we oh. shared the same thesis advisor. She was also an English major. Oh, that's so weird. And um, her big song, well, before Tom Steiner, it was Luca and Cracking mm -hmm. and... I, so I came, I got to know her and that album when I was at Barnard, oh. and I just thought she was incredible and life-changing for me. Um, I've never met her, but that was um, that was a big part of being a songwriter for me was knowing that women had, you know, paved the way. And mm -hmm. Lori Anderson also went to Barnard. Oh. I'm not as familiar with her stuff, but um, but it, there were various people in the spotlight again, like at the, at the time, like Edie Brickell and. Um, and shortly following that was the Sundays. That was more around the time we met, right? Um, and so when I when I graduated college, I went to I went and visited a friend in Israel for six weeks, and I had just been in Chicago just visiting. Um, just I went up for a weekend early that summer, right after graduating, and. I went back to St. Louis and I went up, drove up to Chicago with a friend and I saw another childhood friend of mine in a theater company called The New Criminals and they were doing this really punk rock improvisational theater called basically a bastardization of um, Théâtre du Soleil mm -hmm. and I, I, it was the most incredible thing I had ever seen and I, I really wanted to be a part of it and I logged that and went to Israel, and when I came back, I moved to Chicago. I just threw a bunch, all my bags in the back seat of my car and drove up, and um, I remember being on this solo journey and listening to Pink Floyd driving up there for some oh, reason. <laughs> and, um, and I moved in with a childhood friend. I moved in, I just rented a room from my big sister's friend and, um, in Wrig Wrigleyville, Lakeview area. And um, I got a job waiting tables, and I joined this theater company. And when I had been, and I also, you know, continued seeing bands and writing songs, and and there was a critical critical juncture for me at which this theater company that was so revelatory and so life changing for me. It was an incredible experience. Um, it was run by guys, and they had um, they had just done a series of plays that had very few female parts in it. And um, for the last play, there were there was only there were only two female roles, really one. And so I was an understudy or a double cast for the main role, and I was also in the band for the play. And at the end of that, I realized I really needed to run my own show, mm -hmm. whatever that was. And I had um, I had also done headshots and gone and met an agent and showed him the headshots, and he said, well, you know we. We would probably use this photo of you, the, the non-smiling one, because you don't have, you can't see your crooked tooth. And I was like, I have a crooked tooth? What? <laughs> and, um, and that became representative to me of that moment. It epitomized why I didn't want to go into acting. I didn't want people to be pointing out my supposed flaws, of which I was unaware, like blissfully <laughs> unaware. And, um, and it was around that time that um, the guy I was seeing said, I really see you as a singer-songwriter. And, and he suggested I, I, I write a song every day. And so I, I set about writing a song every day. And I went to a studio where my brother was recording in St. Louis, and he recorded a few songs for me. And that New Year's Eve, um, I had a, a, we had a little gathering, my boyfriend and I, mm -hmm. and um, a woman named Lily Taylor was there. She was also, you know, a Chicago actor, gone mm -hmm. big, yeah. and she was back in town, and she came over, and I remember she was an ex of my then boyfriend, and, oh. and I had mixed feelings about her coming to the party. And he said, really, you're going to love her. You need to meet Lily. Mm -hmm. You're going to love her. And I said, okay. <laughs> and, um, and I did, but more importantly, she, I, at one point, I 
put the songs on I the cassette that I had <laughs> of the stuff I just recorded and she came directly over to me and said is this you I said yeah and she said you have to meet my friend Nina she just got back from school she she she's an incredible singer she writes songs too you have to meet her and um, I said okay so she um, I mean she said it with such such uh, vindication that yeah. she, that I not vindication what's the word I'm looking for such um, clarity determination whatever <laughs> um, um, vehemence thank you that uh, that I I just heard that and said okay and and agreed on the spot and then she set us up on sort of a blind date I don't want to jump through That's all cute. of your <laughs> post college stuff but she set us up on a blind date and. Um, Nina called and we had, I, we, or I called her, I don't remember, we exchanged numbers. Lily was later at a, at a party of Nina's mm -hmm. and said the same thing to her later that same night. And I guess she was party jumping. <laughs> I know, I was going to say, she goes to a lot of parties, <laughs> Lily Taylor. <laughs> and, um, and so we had a date to get together. Lily then skipped town, went back to New York where she lived and, and left me and Nina to get together. Mm -hmm. And, um... I had to cancel because I had a really bad cold and I called Nina and told her I had a really bad cold and she heard vegetables being chopped in the background <laughs> and thought she doesn't have a bad cold, she's, she's chopping vegetables, <laughs> <laughs> they're making dinner, everything they're having. She's blowing me off, I thought you weren't playing. <laughs> but um, but it, was, it was all, it's all Lily's fault, mm -hmm. we have Lily to thank. Um, were your songs acoustic? Like, yeah. were you both doing acoustic songs? At that time, we were. Yeah. Right? But I was just wondering what kind of yeah. songs they were. Um, I moved back to Chicago after Tufts. Um, I worked in an art gallery <clears throat> that represented a lot of really, really inspiring female artists, um, visual artists, conceptual artists. And um, so I was 20, 21. 21 and um, working at the gallery and um, again like seeing my life in terms of art and thinking about going to graduate school in art history but secretly wishing you know and watching MTV and looking at magazines and you know feeling like oh, but that's what I really want to mm -hmm. do and um, but but I also you know had a great passion for art and um, and a lot of these artists that we represented at the gallery were women that inspired me to either make art, write songs, um, mostly just to be sort of brave and courageous in terms of what I was willing to expose in my, mm -hmm. you know, expose of myself, you know. Um, and so there was this sort of similarity between these women Sophie Kahl, Chrissy Sherman, Sherry Levine, um, Yana Sterbach, all these artists who, um, yeah, who were sort of like rock stars of the art world, mm -hmm. who made me feel like I want to make art somehow. Like, yeah, I'm going in this academic route, but I want to create. I, uh, that's what, uh, that's what I want to do. So everything I was absorbing at that time, I was trying to figure out how am I going to how am I going to create and feel like I am in charge of, you know, the, the output as opposed to just watching or observing or analyzing, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, so I had a guitar at my, in my little apartment in Chicago and I, um, an acoustic guitar and an electric guitar, but no amp, um, <laughs> and no distortion pedals. And, um, and all this time, you know, I would go see every band that came through town and um, in Chicago, and I would go see, you know, and I saw, this was a, a common um, experience that Louise and I had. I went to see Wendy and Lisa um, perform, Wendy and Lisa from Prince's band originally, but who had made records on their own with other women, um, and saw this stage filled with women playing their instruments and singing, and was totally totally completely blown away and inspired and it felt still out of reach to me but it felt a little bit closer like a mm -hmm. little bit like I, I need to be writing writing music and um, so I was writing at home I had a little four track uh, that I would record songs on I didn't really know what I was doing but it was enough 
at least enough to be able to hear what my songs sounded like and I could sing harmony with myself. But all I wanted to do was sing harmony with someone else. I don't think he realizes that the drums are coming through the speakers. Let's just tap him on the shoulder. If you tap him, I'll talk. So drums are coming through the speakers. Oh, sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> I, didn't, I, I, don't, I didn't think you realized. I'm we're in a recording studio. Yeah, yeah, we're in a recording studio. Future viewers of this um, video. You're going to be editing this, right? Oh, yeah. They're, <laughs> we'll do all that at the end, but yes. Right, yeah. but I mean, you want to have like me saying vindication in there, right? I can cut that out for you, you if you want. <laughs> I yeah. appreciate that. <laughs> you corrected yourself almost immediately. You know, it's a vindication. And like, with such vindication. Yeah, and we can you cut it corrected out. yourself to the image. <laughs> okay, so um, so anyway, I was nervous. so um, yeah, so I was writing songs, and all I wanted to do was um, was write. I mean, was was sing with someone else. Singing in harmony was the greatest experience. You know, I would do that with my brother all the time, but you know, he was in San Francisco, and I wanted to find people to make music with. So simultaneously, so I'm working at the gallery, then I move on to the museum in, in um, Chicago, the Art Institute, and um, I'm working there, and um, is that where I was working when I met you? Yeah. Or was that the gallery? Okay. And um, anyway, and I put some ads in the local paper and in, in the reader looking for people to play music with, saying, you know, singer-songwriter looking for a guitar player. And, um, so I met with a few dudes, came to my apartment, totally <laughs> not cool at yeah. all, like ridiculous experiences, no one I connected with. I was just saying, like, no way. And so I was just feeling like I can't do this alone. I didn't feel like I could do it alone. I didn't have the um, the ability to like self promote. I wasn't the kind of person who was going to go out and busk and like make it, you know. So it was passion, but there was so much fear around that passion. And um, and then the Lily thing happened. So Lily came to town. She and I were talking. We had a lot of similar taste in music. We we shared. She and I shared all of our music with each other. Made mixtapes for each other all the time. And she said, you've really got to do this. You're so, you're so good at this. Why aren't you doing this? And I said, I just can't. I can't do it on my own. I can't. I don't have it in me. Like, mm -hmm. I just didn't have that thing that makes you go out and just play, no matter, yeah. you know. I didn't have it. Um, and so she called me. She came over on New Year's Eve after she'd been at Louise's house. And she said, I met this woman who's writing songs you guys need to meet. And... Um, promise me you'll call her and it was like that what and it was because Louise forced me to <laughs> to actually go out in public in front of people and you know and to go into the studio and she's still forcing me to do it now <laughs> well you do seem different that way like so is I totally get I mean, I'm d I, it's all I wanted in the world. It's like yeah, she's no. enabling my dreams yes. and did back then. And I, I not like that you said that because I'm that kind of, I'm like, I just don't have that where I, yeah, friends of mine stand on the street and, play, and I'm, I just sit and, I don't know. I don't, I don't have, have it. Thing. I don't yeah. have it. There's a kind of, there's a fear and a, um, uh, I don't know what it is. The self-promotion like, thing. It's like, Yeah, no, no. there's some kind of shame or something mm -hmm. in like, you know, it's almost like I'm looking in the mirror too much. I'm caring too much about, I don't know what it is, but, you know, not to sell myself short, you know, I do feel like, you know, there's, there's all of the, like, I would dream about it forever. I'd be in my room writing the songs and mm -hmm. playing the songs and playing them for my friends, but not going out there and doing it. Yeah. And, and so, um, I needed somebody to push me out the door. And, and what, are you the opposite kind of, cause it seems like you've always been performing a little, a little bit. I mean, even in high school and musical yeah. theater and stuff, you don't, I mean, it seems like you, um, balance each other out. That we balance each other. We definitely balance each other beautifully. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's in terms of Nina and her talent and her art, I feel like, and this is universally speaking, but certainly in, in for speaking about her specifically, I feel like the world is a better place for hearing her, and that it would be a tragedy for the world not to hear her sing and mm -hmm. for not to hear her songs and her sentiment. And so I've always just felt so excited by her art that I want to draw it out of her push her up there, make it happen, here's the mic, 
I'm plus, I'm pressing record. I'm just <laughs> placing. And I'm, she got really good at doing it on her own too. She made a few albums worth of that. But um, you know, in the beginning, it was it was like um, I was. I really felt like I mean Nina had a career. She really did. She had a, she was beginning a career. I was waiting tables. That was mm -hmm. not going to be my career. And what I saw was I'm at this at that juncture. And there could have been another chapter, and there still could be another chapter. But like at that juncture, it was like I'm either going to be an actor or I'm going to be a professional musician. Those are the two options. Okay. And um, I'm waiting tables to pay rent while I do one of those things. And um, so the, the, the stakes were really high, you know, and it was, a, and so recording a song a day was, meant business, you know, it meant like I'm starting the beginning, I'm beginning this thing that's going to be huge and life consuming. And I think I sort of, you know, I don't want to say demanded, but I requested that of Nina. You know, I basically said like, are you on board with me? Are we doing this? Like the first time we sang together, I couldn't believe her voice. First of all, yeah. it was one of the most beautiful voices I'd ever witnessed in person, if not the most. And then I heard us together. And even though it was me, I could tell that what we had was really special. And right then and there, and, and incidentally, she did play <laughs> a song on a cassette, a little tape recorder, of her brother playing guitar and sang along oh, with right, it. Right, um, right, right, right. <laughs> it was a song called The Speed of Candy, which we later yeah. flushed out, finished, and recorded. Oh, you know it? Yeah. Oh, I told you I was a crazy, I you know, I'm a so big sweet. fan. Yeah. I had all the B-sides when I was like 16. Oh my god. Yeah. So that, I know every song. <laughs> that's, that's really touching. Um, well, it was that song, and Jim was playing guitar, and Nina was singing along, and, um, and I loved the song. Mm -hmm. But I also said, all right, you need to start playing guitar. And we did, like, that day. And then I said, how many days a week can you practice? And I think we started doing three days a week right away. And, um, and we worked hard. We worked really hard. It was an exciting time. And we both had four tracks. I had a little Tascam. Is yours Tascam? Yeah. And we recorded everything. Um, I was a crazy fanatic logger fanatical mm -hmm. logger so I had a notebook in which I logged everything we did and that's what got me through like as I was waiting tables I worked at this jazz club called Andy's downtown Chicago on State and Hubbard mm -hmm. and and bet in between like bringing out food to people and whatever I would just log what we had done at practice and what we were doing the next Aww. day names of the songs, <laughs> names of the songs uh -huh. keep it all very organized I'm not as organized anymore but that was that at that time we were just beginning everything and I was so excited you know and that's what got me through my days into the next day and through those shifts, and um, and anyway, um, and we we started we wrote like crazy. We were writing songs constantly, and and it was so fun because we had a partner, yeah, you know, for him to play these songs and with whom to to sing them. And we love singing harmony. Like when like Nina was saying, when I sang with my mom as a little girl, I found out I learned then it was the best thing in the world. And then when I sang in choirs, I sang in musicals. I was in the chorus. I was the lead. I did all of that stuff. And, and then in college, too, and, and then I sang on my own for a long time. And so when we met, um, you know, it was, it, was, it was just this incredible passing. Um, you guys were, did you play live then? I read somewhere that you played at coffee houses and we stuff, did. like acoustically. We did open mics, harmony. and okay. you know, Louise forced me to go play open mics. <laughs> yeah. And it was great. I mean, Do you have stage I'm, fright or anything? Or I don't just, have stage once fright. Once you get up there? Okay. No, I have, um, I think, like... Uh, what's now called executive function disorder, which is like I have a hard time making decisions and really following through. Okay. Um, if the structure's there, I'm fine. So like, I wasn't afraid to go on stage. I was just, I was like, afraid to leave my apartment. You know <laughs> what I mean? It wasn't. Once mm -hmm. I was there, and once you know she got me there, I was in heaven. Yeah. I love it. I love performing. I feel totally comfortable on stage. Okay. I don't have stage fright at all. Um, I just have a hard time, like, transitioning from one place to another. Oh, all right. <laughs> I mean, it's not debilitating. Yeah, yeah. But it's just, like, a thing about me. It's, like, hard. I get, I, I hunker down wherever I am, and it's hard to make the next move. You know? You're better getting back on the bus than I am. I have that problem in hotels. That's true. That's true. <laughs> that's true. That's a different, that's a different disorder. I don't know what that's called. But mine has a name. It's yeah. just like I have a hard time pulling the trigger. Right. You know? Um, 
When did you decide to start a band or to like recruit more members um, and play the kind of music that you ended up playing? Because it actually seems like, I didn't realize your influences were so uh, kind of diverse and... Well, totally diverse. I mean, yeah. our influences, it's like range from musical theater to Led Zeppelin, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Bob Dylan, Joni Mitchell, to Prince. the Prince, the Pixies, the Breeders, Brandy, you know, yeah. all everything, like B-52s, oh my god, oh, yeah. for me, I, oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, those are the records we were buying in high yeah. school, yeah, okay. and yeah. and we were, you know, anything with a melody, basically, anything with a good melody, or and a good, like, driving rock, you know, spirit, like, mm -hmm. we loved it, you know, and, and we both individually loved all that stuff, came together, and we could have gone in, I mean, I have videotape of the two of us when we first started getting together those three days a week when Louise was logging, um, <laughs> where we're, we're singing folk songs. We've both got acoustic guitars. We could have totally been, you know, a different v version of the Indigo Girls, mm -hmm. or who were not really an influence, I think, on either of them. I never owned any of their, their records, but, um, but two women, acoustic guitar, singing in harmony, writing songs, you know, that are... Not necessarily that dark, but but a little. I mean, kind of dark. The content was always dark, but the music was kind of right. Content. You'll was... see my head explode. Oh right, 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 right. right. <laughs> what about to be safe? It was written after watching a, a, a TV show about women in prison. Oh god. <laughs> right. So we were always heavy, like in terms of the content, but we were playing strummy guitar, and then what? What changed? We went to see. We went to see the Breeders after Pod came out. Oh yeah. Was this like together? So this was like nine, like ninety one. This was or early nineties. Yeah, we met ninety one, ninety two. Yeah, 90, we yeah. met ninety one. So I think it was Chris. It was New Year's Eve ninety one. So ninety one yeah. into ninety two. Right. And we went to see the Breeders together. But prior to that, like, well, at Barnard, a friend of mine turned me on to Pixies Do a Little, Brian Eno, Another Green World, and right, and and Jane's Addiction happened. Mm -hmm. Nothing shocking yeah. happened. Well. Guns N' Roses had happened, and then addiction <laughs> happened. And I saw the Nothing Shocking tour in, in Chicago, and that changed my life. And we, Nina and I, grew up on Prince, loved Prince, yeah. um, had always been singing, you know, the mad harmonies in Prince. I know that Jim is also a big fan, and those harmonies play into what we do a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but the, when we met in Chicago, did we see Co the Cocker Twins and Mazzy Starr together? No. You, okay. You, you saw them. I never saw either of them. So Mazzy Starr, She Hangs Brightly had just come out. I was a big Cocker Twins fan. Mm -hmm. And My Bloody Valentine, Loveless, came yep. out. And so uh, that changed everything. And then Belly, um, the first album with Feed the Tree. Star. Star, thank you. Um, it's one of my favorite mm -hmm. records happened. Juliana Hatfield was happening and we both really liked her. And um, so the Boston scene was figuring heavily into our lives. And and then Pod happened and we saw the Breeders at, at the Metro in Chicago and that was life changing. Mm -hmm. And that was band changing. And I think part of that we were playing we we're playing we we're playing electric guitar with fuzz pedals. And little amps. Yeah. But when we saw that, it cha it, it dramatically shifted things for us. For like, and um, but what was the thing? Like, when did we make that transition from acoustic to the distortion pedals? Like, when did it? Why did I get my rap pedal? And why did we start playing with amps? I thought I thought that was because we did the open mics. That was acoustic. Mm -hmm. And then I thought it was seeing Pod. Oh really? It could have been. I mean, seeing the Breeders on the Pod tour or the Safari. They put out the EP. And oh we yeah. Went to see it them at Metro, and um, I feel like that's when we just said, you yeah. know what, it's, also I think we were starting to write songs, because I had written um, uh, Cock of Nothing, Rooster. Oh yeah. That was the, oh no, that was the first song I wrote on Electric with, with Distortion. Anyway, I don't I know remember, that song too. Just but you do? Of course they do. <laughs> um, but no. Hold the, the me up, back <laughs> in a <laughs> Like, there was a moment where it was just like, you know what, we can do this all day long, and it's beautiful, but there was this feeling of, like, we want to stand up, 
We don't want to sit on stools. We want to, you know <laughs> what I mean? Rock. We don't <laughs> stool rock. We want to stand up. We want to stomp on our pedals. We want to, you know, we want to do this. We can do this. And and it was also a feeling of like, can our voices be heard over mm -hmm. the din of loud, loud, loud electric guitars? And yes, the breeders were doing it. My bloody Valentine was doing yeah. it. And that was really what I was interested in at that time was a wall of sound with, with vocals just sort of just sort of over the surface. And yeah. when I wrote the song Wolf, which you probably know. Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's on an actual album. <laughs> yeah, but that, that's, on a, that's an yeah. easy one. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's so, so difficult. Um, that, that was meant to be like just wall of sound guitars, big guitars with vocals sort of just over the top. Mm -hmm. and, and then it ended up being more vocal centric, which is fine because that's how we evolved. Um, but seeing my bloody Valentine live was what made what gave me confidence that we could actually have our vocals be our voices be heard over the day. Yeah. You, know. you saw my bloody Valentine on Valentine's Day. Yeah. In and 1992. It, it was 92 or 91. 92. Okay. It was right after we met. It was. Oh, that's exactly that's yeah. exactly right. So it was 91, oh, 92. There. No. Uh -huh. And then I remember you came over. We were rehearsing. You tried to get me to go with you. Oh really? God. Yes. And I was having drama with my boyfriend at the time and something, and I didn't go. Yeah, that's what it was. That was 92, so that was February 14th. That I know. I'm so jealous. 92. That's why I'm so glad all of these reunion shows and tours are happening, because I can go and see the bands that I missed yeah. when I was, like, <laughs> too young <laughs> to yeah. go. Yeah. Um, okay, so how did you recruit your brother and Steve? Because didn't oh. you want an all-girl band at first? Yeah, well, you kind of other... spoken openly about. Yeah, the that. other um, thing that changed my life so much was seeing L Seven play. Mm -hmm. I didn't know who they were, and I'm about to go um, be interviewed for them. Hey, yeah. found Steve. Yeah. Okay. Um. So um, I, I think I answered an ad in the reader. Um. There was a girl put an ad in the paper wanting to a Chicago local paper wanting to. Um, start a band, and I liked her influences, and I answered her ads prior to meeting Nina, just prior, maybe like a few months. And I went, she, she, we got on the phone, and she said to meet her at this club called the Avalon, and um, and that, which is incidentally where um, Billy Corgan met Darcy. Um, <laughs> a lot of people met there. A lot of things happened there, um, and that there was a band called L7 playing, and I had never heard of them, and so I just showed up at this club. And I never found the girl. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what she looked like. I didn't know who to look for. But I saw this band, and I thought, I thought these girls were the for some reason not not really. In, I don't know. I don't know how I possibly thought this in a small club. But I thought these girls were the roadies oh, really? setting up oh, their God. gear. <laughs> and I thought, oh, God, God, these guys have really cool girl roadies. They've got a lot of them. <laughs> 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 and then they stopped on their guitars and started yeah. playing and um, you know blew my head off and mm -hmm. then and that was that and then when Nina and I met I already felt or or at some point you know that was that had made its imprint and I thought I felt like we should start all female band and we had seen Wendy and Lisa and we were so um, we were so compelled well we were compelled to start a female band because of having seen these other yeah. groups and because we thought that was the strongest most feminist thing to do at the time also and um, and coming out of being in a theater company that was predominantly male though there were tons of really talented women in the theater company um, I really wanted to, to be you know forced by numbers I wanted to yeah. see all, uh, 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 all women and then we put an ad we put our own ad in the reader um, for uh, t for two girls and um, for a female rhythm section, and we actually did meet with a few girls. Unfortunately, they couldn't play their instruments very well. Mm -hmm. One of them could. That yeah. Amanda. Amanda. Don't remember her last name. She was so great. Remember oh, she, she moved was to a, Minneapolis. Right, right. She was a really good drummer. Yeah, she was a really good drummer. Mm -hmm. Really lovely person. Mm -hmm. She almost was in our band. She's yep. like the the peep best. Yeah. Of her song. Yep. Um, <laughs> Just didn't. She moved. No, she or... was moving. She oh, so she was she, going she, to. She was going okay. to be in the band, yeah. Um, but we, um, I mean, we really were kind of committed to the idea of being in an all-girl band. I think it was really, you know, we were very much 
this was 1992, and we were um, we were feminists. We yeah. were conscious of the fact that there would be something really empowering and powerful, you know, empowering for us to be in a setting where it's all women and there are no dudes telling us what to do and there are no dudes who play their instruments better than we do telling us, you know, grabbing our guitars. <laughs> so much for that. So much for that. <laughs> yeah, and it was like, that, that was something we really wanted to do. And, um, and we tried and we just didn't find, yeah. we didn't find the right people. Luckily, Steve Lack saw that ad for an all girl band oh, for an okay. all girl and just called and said, I'm not I'm not a girl. But <laughs> I mean I kind of am like a girl. <laughs> I like you know, Patsy Klein and you know, whatever like oh, that's Lucinda so cute. Williams or whatever he said, I can't even remember. We Big Star and My Bloody Valentine and the Pixies were our influences and yeah. you know, we touted ourselves as a dreamy grunge band. Mm -hmm. And those were our influences, and Steve called and said, I really like your influences. Yeah. I'm not a girl. I'm not a girl. <laughs> um, and I remember we were sitting, we were, you and I were sitting on my bed, and we, and I think we were like, who's going to call him back? Remember that? Mm -hmm. I don't remember who did, though. I remember talking you to did. him. You did, yeah. Yeah, I so remember fun. talking to him. But anyway, and he came, he came over to Louise's apartment in Chicago where we were, we were practicing, and he was great. He's such a good player He's such yeah a good bass player and, and just like now it's sort of like that's he was exactly what he brought to the song was exactly what the song needed mm -hmm. and he made the song better he elevated it yeah yeah so Steve came so then um, then Steve and Louise and I started playing with some other drummers male and female and we also just yeah we started playing with Steve regularly and getting getting our songs together with him teaching him our songs um, and then, right, we took a little time to get to know him and then started playing with drummers. Yeah, and there were no drummers that we really dug. And, you know, we still didn't have a practice space. We were playing, like, letting people set up drums in your apartment in oh, God. Andersonville. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we went to a few places. I feel like we went to people's houses. Chioko's basement. Chioko's basement. So then, um, and then I think we just, we, this, this young woman, Amanda, I don't remember her last name, as I said, but she played with us. It seemed like, oh, we've got it. Now it's going to be Steve, Amanda, Louise, and Nina. And um, and then she had to move or she couldn't practice. I can't remember what was going on. And then my brother was just moving. But he had just moved back from San Francisco. My brother's a really good guitar player. He was a songwriter. He was in a band at Yale. He was in bands in, in um, San Francisco. And he moved to Chicago. He didn't know what he was doing. And he was like, well, I'll learn to play the drums. I could always play, like, you know, in college. I just Oh, he didn't play at all? No. No, he didn't, own a drum, he didn't own a drum kit. Oh. He was like, I'll, I'll get a drum kit. You know, I, I, I think I know. You know, I listen to enough Led Zeppelin. Like, I know how John Bonham plays. I can play. <laughs> and we were like, really? You can? And it's So I said, I, I don't know. I just said, well, let's just see if my brother, you know, can do it. And so that's when we went to our friend Chioko's basement her drummer had drums set up, so he played her drums? Or? Yeah. We actually, we had played there with another drummer. Do you remember that? Yeah. He was kind of a jockey drummer. Yeah. And I remember thinking, this guy's really good. Why is he so wrong for us? Yeah. You know, I can tell he's got chops. He knows right. what he's doing, but he is so wrong for us. And so in the same friend, our friend's basement, the same space, we played with Jim. And my memory is that he was like, well, I'll help you guys out. Like, like I'll, I'll just like short term. Down. Yeah, like, short term. Yeah, like yeah, one night. Yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'll come down. You yeah. know, yeah. like just to give you guys an idea of what it's like to play with someone. Like maybe it would be fun for him. I don't know. Yeah, and um, but he was helping us out, and he came down and and played, and um, you know, he didn't execute all his fills really well or anything, and but he had the best feel. Mm -hmm. He was fantastic. He still has that great feel. Yeah, and and um. After the rehearsal, I was so excited. I was just like, can you get a kit? Can you start? Can you want to play with us? Can we do this? And he's like, okay, sure, I guess, you know. And that was that. And I, w I remember, I always tell this story, I hope it's not too corny, but I woke up the next day like, what happened last night? <laughs> yeah, I mean, he really did, like, elevate our songs to yeah. a whole, like, all yeah. of a sudden we heard what we could sound like. Because before that, it was sort of like, we didn't really know who we were. We knew we knew sort of in terms of the content and the songwriting and but in terms of the actual like arrangement, production, what it was gonna be like and we didn't know how heavy we could be. 
really didn't. It was like he hit so hard yeah. and, um, you know, just brought our songs to this much heavier, harder, more rock yeah. kind of level. Yeah, and all of a sudden we knew it was like, this is, this is what we want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when did you start playing shows as a band? And when did you record American Thighs? Was it, do you record and then get signed? New Year's Day, 1994, mm -hmm. we went into the studio. It's a lot of New Year's Day. Yeah, a lot of New Year's Meetings stuff. Meetings uh -huh. and, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and we had actually just seen Liz Fair play the night before. So mm -hmm. New Year's Eve that year we saw Liz Fair at the Metro. And um, she, she had finished her record, Exile in Guyville, with this guy over here. And... <laughs> Yeah, cool though. And, uh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah I know he did. It's not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Just that guy. Yeah, it's Brad. Yeah. I said, I'm like, oh, you're Brad. What? You didn't hear that? Yeah, and I, I immediately you. felt stupid. I was like, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, he doesn't get to be a rock star. It's <laughs> nice. He's got, head, he's got headphones on. Okay. Oh, I know that's why I'm saying all this. It's fine. But, you know, it's Sorry. nice for him to, to be recognized as such, you know? Yeah. Uh, plus, he was in her band. So we had just been, we had just seen him perform the night before, mm -hmm. and we had just seen Liz play, and um, my there's dad. someone in front. That's my oh. dad. <laughs> Nina's dad is here. I know, should I pause it? It's okay. Can she, can you, do you can... Oh, I don't mind if yeah. you... Do gonna, you want to go, let yeah. us say hello? Yeah. Okay. Dad. <laughs> okay. Should I just pause it, or do you want to just keep talking? You can pause it. Okay. I know. I think largest, um, it, it's the largest archive of women's history, basically, like women's oral history mm -hmm. archive, right? Yeah. Um, Gloria okay. Stein. Um, I do forget what we were talking about again. We were talking about um, Jim and yes. um, shows, American Thighs. Oh, yeah. So we just played with Liz Fair on New Year's Eve, mm -hmm. um, 1993 into 94. And Wait, can I interrupt really quick? Yeah. How did you get a show with Liz Fair? We didn't play with her. We did. Oh, oh we did that night. With her. Not that night. No, no, no. We didn't that night. We saw oh, her. Oh, okay, play. okay. Um, we played with her. At Rock for Choice. It was a Rock for Choice benefit that we played with Liz. Maybe that was New Year's Eve. But our, that no, wasn't no, no, our. No, no, no. We saw Han and Liz Fair. Correct. But then we did play a show with Liz at Metro yeah. Rock for Choice. Yeah, I remember. But that was that later. was later. Okay. But our first show was at a club um, called Phyllis's Musical Inn. Um, Louise booked it. She did everything. Mm -hmm. Louise, <laughs> Louise was the one that got us to record a four-song demo um, with some weird dude down in the south side. <laughs> what can I say? And, yep, you did. <laughs> and then um, Louise was also the one to book our first show while my brother and I were certainly saying, we're not ready, we're not ready, because that's what we do. Yeah. We're not ready, we're not ready. I don't know what Steve said, probably just like, whoa, okay. <laughs> and um, and Louise went, you know, went around with her, with the four track um, demo, four song demo, and gave it to people and okay. sent it out to all the clubs and... But Jim did the artwork. Jim did the artwork, yeah. Takes, takes four. Mm -hmm. And... Um, yeah, and so Louise got our first gig at a little club called Phyllis's Musical Inn, and uh, we started rehearsing and played a bunch of songs, some of which ended up on our first album. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Brad Wood, our producer, was there at that show. Mm -hmm. uh, he came to see this band called Elliot, with whom we shared a practice space, and we were opening for them. Right. Okay. And he came to see Elliot because they were doing Fleetwood Mac in its entirety. They right? were doing uh, rumors. Fleetwood Mac rumors, rumors in its entirety. Mm -hmm. Not Fleetwood Mac the band. The yeah, band, yeah. The, the album rumors. And um, and he and that you know happened to see us that night. Um, we were interested in recording with him or Steve Albini, the two producers whom we respected, mm -hmm. you know, a great deal in Chicago, and. Um, Steve liked. Uh, Steve got our cassette. I gave it to him. I gave everyone our cassette. The forced the demo. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, but Brad is the person we ended up recording with, and we. Um, but that came about because so so we played that first show, second show, third show, tiny little clubs. At our third show, there was this dude named Jim Powers who had a little indie label called Minty Fresh. After our third show, he wanted to sign us. Okay. He wanted to do a single with us. And um, you have a seven inch. And so we said, great, let's do it. And we got a lawyer. Mm -hmm. 
to, to broker that deal. I know. Mean, and then, at that, we didn't have a manager. Um, and then, um, we decided, I guess, that we wanted to do it with Brad. Maybe Jim Powers knew Brad. Yeah, I think that's what it was. He had a deal with Brad. Brad was recording seven inches for his label. Okay. And so we started out, we went in to record with Brad, and we brought Seether in All Hail Me. Mm -hmm. And we were just going to do a seven inch with him. We had just demoed Seether at another studio, and we were like, all right, let's do this song. But very quickly, that turned into a full-length album. Mm -hmm. And we ended up, we were going to do it in like two weeks, but we were not that kind of band. So we were, we ended up going in over the course of the next few months while in between touring, we were padding it with touring, and we were touring in a van around the Midwest and the East Coast. And we did uh, South by Southwest. And so our 7-inch came out right when we played South by Southwest, okay. which was a pivotal moment for us and kind of a seminal show for us because every, every industry person was there. And at that moment, like at that juncture, um, it seemed like the whole industry descended on us, and we we ended up being courted by most almost every major label mm -hmm. with our seven inch just on the you know on the virtues of our seven inch. Um, it came out that summer. Um, someone at Hits Magazine sent it to someone at K Rock. Jim Powers was working the England uh, angle, and so while we were finishing our record up, see their hit and became a big single in England and then in LA and all over the states. And we were actually trying to hold the record, hold the song back because mm -hmm. the record wasn't ready yet. Um, it wasn't coming out till September. But um, as it happened, it was it was all good, of course. And it and it became what it became. And it got us on a tour bus. And um, the record came out in September. And we we uh, went on tour with Hole, and um, that was ninety four. Okay. Um. I'm, I feel like some, I always preface everything I say in these interviews so far is that I love you guys. I love everyone I'm interviewing, but there are some questions. I just don't want it to come out the wrong way. Um, but there was a lot of, and I'm just wondering if, the, if it was this way at the time, there was a lot of controversy surrounding, um, your kind of like quick trajectory to success. And so... I actually just wrote, um, it was like a 30-page paper on the representation of women in rock music, and I referenced two articles uh, about you, and one was, I think, in the Chicago Tribune or something, and they were kind of using um, larger male-fronted bands to who liked you, but they were using them to like validate your success because people seemed to be very resentful um, of how big you got. Uh, so quickly. Yeah. Was, was it actually that way at the time? Like, oh, did you get that? Totally. You felt the backlash? Totally. Mm -hmm. Huge. So we started out and we, um, you know, we played these little shows at these little clubs. People started, we got this sense something was happening. We were making this single. People were coming to see us. And I think originally, locally, people were excited by us because maybe we didn't play our instruments as well as other bands, but we wrote songs that, um, were melodic, were intelligent, and people liked them. People mm -hmm. liked what we were doing at first. Yeah. They really did, and they were excited by the two, you know, what, what we were doing was was exciting, and all the people in, you know, rock bands in Chicago, everyone would come to see us, everyone was kind of buzzing about us, and it was all really, really, really positive, really positive. We felt so much support in Chicago mm -hmm. originally, huge support. And then all the labels started coming in, and we couldn't believe this was happening, and it was happening so fast, and um, it was flattering, and and we really, you know, we were really proud of what we were doing in the studio with Brad. We had no idea how many people were going to hear it. We thought, you know, wow, this is really cool. This is really cool, and it's really good, and we were proud of it. So then, um, as soon as things started to take off. Uh, I think there was a resentment, a backlash. It was like people suggested that we were just some marketing ploy by, you know, major label by Geffen. Mm -hmm. um, we were like some fabricated, like Menudo type, Milli Vanilli type, <laughs> whatever, um, fabrication, and that yeah. we weren't really, which is funny because like, you know, we were obviously playing all of our own instruments and whether we were proficient or, you know, super slick or, you know, that that had nothing to do with it. I think people just, like, they were, um, 
they didn't in Chicago in particular they kind of eat their own like mm -hmm. when when things get too big um, it's not cool it's not punk rock we weren't indie enough we were too melodic um, we were I, I don't know we were too cute we were too cute well that <laughs> yeah. was part of it honestly yeah. it was part of it it was like um, yeah we were too cute we, we Louise got completely like uh, skewered for putting on lipstick on stage in England and London we played this big show in London and like all of a sudden it was like she's not a feminist mm -hmm. remember that <laughs> it was like applying lippy on stage and it was like a lipstick feminist yeah yes. yeah and, and we were we didn't understand we felt like we were we were strongly identified with our feminism and our, oh, our, our, the fact that we were feminists. Mm -hmm. We felt like we were doing something that, that we could be completely proud of and should have been proud of. And people were just knocking us down saying, yeah, we were too cute. Yeah. Well, and, and too powerful. It was too much. And so it was, it was the classic, like, these girls are too, they're too big for us and we, we want to, we need to yeah. get them, you know, take them down a notch. And ironically, it is, it is what happened to me uh, with Liz Fair, I think both of us actually, you know, we were blurly aware of this new name on, in, you know, in town, Liz Fair, with this new record, and all of a sudden she became the hottest thing since, you know, the, the coolest thing to ever happen yeah. in Chicago, and she was everywhere, and there was a, we were sort of deluged by text, by press about her, and, and I was kind of over her, and I, before I'd even heard her music, and ready to dislike it. Her having just made Exile and Guyville with Brad Wood, and um, both Nina and I were surprised and a little, um, you know, well, we were surprised by how much we loved the record, yeah, and and how much it penetrated and really did leave its mark on us, and um, and that was sort of the classic, you know, not being so overwhelmed by by someone's press that you just have an, a tendency to not want to like them, a predisposition mm -hmm. to not liking them, and then being, you know, actually having, uh, learning that one really likes this artist. Yeah. So I think that happened with us too. A lot of people heard about us, there was such a mad buzz about us that they just didn't want to like us prior to prior to hearing our music. Um, and then and then unfortunately I think that the, the climate then certainly was like uh, who are these upstarts who do they think they are you know Chicago's very blue collar town you're not allowed to make it big and they always like Nina said they eat their young like when mm -hmm. people come out of there like whether it's sticks or Cheap Trick or um, I don't know Bands of the Past the Pumpkins, pumpkins sure, yeah the, the Pumpkins, pumpkins. had it mm -hmm. um, there's just a big backlash from the city like you didn't pay your dues you didn't work hard enough and it seemed to everyone else like we just came out of nowhere and for us we've been working really hard for yeah. a long time you know? I think some people genuinely just didn't like our music and that's fair too it's yeah, totally it fair um, but I think it was also there were two of us mm -hmm. um, there were two of us we um, you know I think for some people we were too poppy it was too melodic it was too sing-songy or something I don't know what it was, but whatever it was, there were a few really nasty... And people first started talking about our appearance way more than the music. So someone started writing about us as, like, you know, it was way frock, or it was, you know, they're talking about our body types, yeah. and they were talking about, um, you know, our hair, or they were, ta you know, which is whatever, that's what people do, music is fashion and all that. Um, but there was, there were a few articles, probably the one you're talking about, that were really dismissive and insulting, yeah. and we were sort of, we were pissed. Well, we right, were, because the we whole, were really pissed. Yeah, and, and it fueled us. I mean, it was great. Yeah, it it fueled us, and that's what the second, that's what um, blowed out your ass. It's Veruca Salt was. It was basically <laughs> just like and volcano girls and volcano yeah. girls. Yeah. Well, I I read that. Um, yeah, you also kind of struggled and changed a lot how you presented on stage and like the Seether video. I think Louise, you said that you hate it, or you said you look like Muppets or something, but you went for this like jeans and t-shirt thing and then you kind of like reclaimed the femininity with, you know, the Kiss Destroyer boots and dresses and lipstick and stuff, but when American Thighs came out, you kind of went more for the grunge thing to to maybe get less crap from people? I, I'm not sure That's why. That's just kind of who we were but, at that oh, time. Okay. We really were. We, we were. We had, you know, it's like... Yeah, we well, were just t-shirts and jeans. And I wanted to be Kurt Cobain. We both did. Yeah, so yeah. we were... <laughs> Who didn't? I wanted to date him, be him. Yeah. Like, you know. <laughs> right. And 
and so we were we were dressed like him basically, mm -hmm. and that's what that's what the fashion was, and that's what made sense to us. And and then um, <clears throat> when we were recording our album, you know, we we did we got a lot of backlash, we got a lot of, we got a, you know some negative press, and unfortunately, one tends to pay more attention to yeah. that kind of press. So um, so when we did our our EP with Steve Albini, "Blow It Out Your Eyes, It's Veruca Salt," we were um, we were just saying like a big a big fuck you to mm -hmm. to the naysayers and to our little community that had turned its back on us, you know? Yeah. Um, and we wrapped ourselves in toilet paper. Yeah. <laughs> and we were just like, here it is. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, following that, um, Anita and I were really, we were, we, there was a, there was a, we were thrown in the spotlight and there, mm -hmm. we weren't necessarily ready for that. And yeah. We were eager, but we weren't ready. And we didn't have anyone to really... We had people who warned us about things, but we didn't have anyone to say, like, beware someone we really trusted, sort of in our fold, in our family, who could say this is going to happen, and beware of this, and make, you know, make these, you know, work on these, you know, make the smart decisions, make yeah. the smart choices, you know? Except one person did, and it was Vicki Peterson from yeah. The Bangles. That's just thinking. Oh. So Vicki Peterson from The Bangles, um, we sat down, we were in, in New Orleans on tour, and we met her, and she was a huge hero of mine. We sat down with her, and she was the one that said, watch out, you guys, because this is happening really fast, and your labels are going to pit you against each other, and your managers are going to pit you against each other. People do not, labels do not do well with two, with, with more than one woman. Mm -hmm. um, they feel, you know, there needs to be a lead singer, there needs to be, you know, a unified voice. It needs to, you're, just watch. It's going to be hard. Photographers will pit you against everyone. It'll, mm -hmm. it's all going to happen. And we were like, that will never happen to us. <laughs> we're best friends. It'll never happen. Yeah, we couldn't believe it. Yeah. But she was also kind of saying, you're only human you know these things are going to happen and there's only so much defense that you have that you even as, as close as you are you know mm -hmm. and but we 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 didn't know enough we weren't able to really take that advice to heart and be aware of all these things that were coming down the pike it was an it was a really exciting time because yeah. we were so proud of our music and we didn't think anyone would ever hear it beyond our friends and family and and so it was exciting and it was um it was sort of alarming to have also to have this backlash that we keep talking about and and not, at the risk of focusing on that too much it did fuel us and when we were making our choice to work with Bob Rock on our next record was also a big F you to everyone at anyone who had said anything negative about us and said that we hadn't paid our dues and um, so we were kind of we were kind of playing that we the, sold out or that we'd sold out. We sold yeah. out. We're like, right. oh really? Well, so we're gonna, now, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> we're gonna go record with Metallica's producer. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's kind which of is Luis says like that was the most punk rock thing we could have done at that point. Truly. That because, actually, yeah. You know, it was just like. Yeah, we're going, we're going, we're going big. Mm -hmm. We right. we had been on tour with Live, opening for Live, and been playing these big sheds all summer long. And their sound person rung out the system every day when during sound check to enter Sandman. And so we heard that song every day while sitting there catering outside <laughs> somewhere eating lunch. And every day we're like, God damn, this sounds good. And I don't know. One day someone said, What if we recorded with Bob, Bob Rock, and um. And, and that resonated, and we pursued it. And at, and at that time, we also had Metallica's management, so we mm -hmm. were it was sort of an easy introduction. Um, and while re recording with him, you know, we laugh about this now. We're like, when did we start? What happened? And when did it mm -hmm. happen? When did we go from grunge to glam? Like, <laughs> it could have been a Tuesday. Was it, was it on a Tuesday? Even the videos, and I mean. <laughs> Well, right. I mean, we had to then we had to wear the clothes and make the videos yeah. to live up to the sound, right? <laughs> because you can't go back to like Tim Rutilli's backyard with an eight millimeter. And yeah, like, right. Like, <laughs> but we really did. I mean, it, I I read an interview with Eric Erlinson from Hall who said like about about the Celebrity Skin uh, album. Mm -hmm. He said something about um, yeah, once you go glam, you can't go back. And oh. So it is kind of true. Like we kind of. Have yeah, we have. I guess we have. I guess 20. <laughs> if you, if you wait 15 years, you can. But you got to wait 15 years. Yeah. Um, uh, well, can you talk a little bit about the recording process of Eight Arms? Um, because I know 
Is it okay to talk about like all the bad stuff? Yeah, of course. You can. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Absolutely. You can say whatever you want, and you can say whatever you want, and I'll say yeah. If you said this at the time, I would have totally freaked out. No, no, no. I know now. Married retrospectively, children. Yeah. Okay. It's fine. All right. Good. All of us would have. Then we'll go back and interview him about what was going on in the sixties and seventies. And yeah, you probably have plenty of yeah. He's got his stories. Okay. Um, but just yeah, I've read I obviously have no idea because you did the tour after the recording and then when you broke up there was a lot of speculation that you know it was tense during the recording process and that's kind of when it started um that there were you started to have creative differences on that record you were writing one kind of song and Louise was writing a different kind of song just if you can elaborate anyway on that time period what it was like and maybe the the tour that followed yeah. Oh, I don't think Brad should I give him a tap? Yeah, I'm going to give him a tap. Damn it, Brad Wood. What Damn it, Brad Wood. <laughs> we hear your drums again. I, I must hit I, I must it by accident. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, no it's right. It's so cool. That I keep having to be like, Brad Wood, turn the drums down. <laughs> Jesus. Um, well, <laughs> one thing that I think is always important to remember is that Part of the whole women women in rock thing is, um, and I'm, I assume this happens. This must happen to guys on some level. But when you spend so much of your time sitting, you know, in a chair getting your makeup done and having your hair done and looking at your face and noticing every little detail, as Louise was talking before about some, you know, agent saying, well, your tooth is a little crooked or mm. whatever. It's like you start looking at all that stuff and then you've got two of you and you're comparing and you're looking over there and you're like, oh, you know, she, she looks skinny and I, look, I don't like what I look like or I don't like my nose or, you know, you just spend way too much time focusing on, now we have this expression, we say focus on the mucus, just focus on the music. <laughs> because my iPhone auto My iPhone autocorrected. Oh, like, okay. We need to focus on the music, but it came up focus on the music. <laughs> But, um, but, you know, there's so much, there, all the trappings of being in a band, if, I mean, if, if this is what you allow to happen, and we did, you know, we enjoyed the, the sort of glamorous aspect of it. It's fun to see yourself all made up and wearing great clothes, and that part is fun. It's fun playing dress up and doing mm -hmm. all that stuff, um, and we did enjoy it. But there's also a darker side, which is you spend more time focusing on that and um, less time on the music. And um, you get very kind of insular and narcissistic. And, you know, there is that aspect of being a quote unquote rock star where, like, you, know, you start feeling powerful. You've got other people taking care of you. You've got people doing everything for you. We would show up at airports, like a, you know, a car would come pick you up, bring you to an airport. You don't know anything about the flight you're on or where. You know, you just mm -hmm. show up, and somebody is bringing you there, and your meals, and all your stuff is. This all this stuff is happening, and you definitely lose. You know, you lose touch with a certain kind of reality, and. We had boyfriends who were also in bands. Um, we we just kind of you you lose your footing in the world, and we didn't have people, as Louise said before, we didn't have people who grounded us. We had people who managers who admitted you know would admit themselves that they didn't really understand women. Um, we had tour managers that were you know addicts, and um, some of them and you know were totally out of control themselves or just um young and young and and not naive really, that's, that and, wasn't their role right necessarily. right right and so we really didn't um we just because we became so i think focused on possibly like the wrong but being on tour because that's the other thing about being on tour unless you are creating while you're on tour unless you are recording as some artists do um you know, you're playing for an hour and a half a night, and then the rest of your day is spent either sleeping, like, you know, you're doing interviews, you're talking about yourself. Yeah. You're, it, it's just a, a really weird world, and we really weren't pre prepared for it. So there was this kind of, and, and we were off in our own, like, boyfriend worlds, you know. Mm -hmm. We weren't really communicating. 
Louise and I weren't. I don't think. I mean, we did a lot, mm -hmm. but there was a lot of, um, I don't know, there was just like divisiveness mm -hmm. all over, all over, coming from all, and if we had sat down and talked about it, I'm sure we would have been fine, but we weren't. We were harboring stuff and, um, and what? Well, when we were working on on the songs for Eight Arms, what had happened was we came out with American Thighs. You know, Nina and I were always like Siamese twins, two women fronting yeah. this band, and for us it felt like we'd been together forever. Of course, it was new to everybody else, right? But um, when we put our first single out and it got so many accolades and we we were really on the map for that song. Um, there was, I began to feel a tendency towards people perceiving Nina as the lead singer of the band, and that freaked me out. Mm -hmm. I was like, what's going on here? <laughs> and then there was, we were always sort of 50-50 back and forth, and how we, you know, played our songs, and the, song, and the amount of songs we put on the record, and we were very much writing songs from our own living rooms and bringing them to each other, so they were like our babies that we then shared and fleshed out and brought to the guys, and they would bring their parts, and they'd become Veruca Salt songs, but... Um, I think I was, I was really kind of afraid at that point that I was going to lose my footing and I was going to fade into the background, which probably like goes back to psychology about my own family splintering and what that meant as a middle child and all that stuff. But so I can see in hindsight how I sort of became afraid of that and was sort of pushing Nina to sort of continue this to make sure that we stayed a fortified front, uh, a unified front, we, that we fortified that. And then, um, and, and, and as I see, and also in hindsight, I, I pushed needlessly because it didn't matter. And mm -hmm. it didn't matter who was perceived as a lead singer or whatever, that it would all come out in the wash and that we are who we are and, and who cares, you know. What matters is that we can be, uh, we keep functioning musicians and, and have, a, have a fruitful career and, um, and enjoy what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but I lost some confidence in the course of that record, and when we came out with the next record, when I was writing songs, I didn't have a ton of confidence. And so, I went into that recording process like that, and of course this is all my memory. And when we were recording, I was sort of looking for that from, the, that kind of, you know, from, for support from the rest of the band, but I wasn't feeling 100% about my songs. And I remember when we sent our demos to Bob, he got our he got all the demos and he said to me at one point, you know, it's interesting. There's it seems like your songs weren't weren't um, treated as much or weren't like fleshed out as much. And I I perceived that as the way I understood that was because I was I was sort of just like stepping back. That's how mm -hmm. it felt. And so so there was that happening with me and then and an insecurity that had come into play and and then insecure about our relationship while that was happening and where where were we standing and and then there was a um, you know over the course of that summer Nina and I got closer the guys felt as Bob stepped in as a producer and really ran the show and we gave him the reins for the record and he, so he could do what he did which is why we hired him the guys kind of felt displaced mm -hmm. and there was some rumblings there and Jim was really unhappy in the band at that point because Jim had always been somewhat of a producer of the band and and he'd always had always had great great songwriting ideas, and he had been a really strong voice in the studio. Mm -hmm. And with Bob as a producer, Jim really didn't have um, didn't have his voice anymore. And so, and Bob really didn't. We were we we tend to be a, a band full of really uh, strong strongly opinionated people, and we are a band full of strongly opinionated people. And and in the studio, that can that can both you know, lead to the magic and can create the magic and it can also be um, time consuming and frustrating and exasperating for everybody involved. And um, so Brad, who was endlessly patient with us in the studio with that dynamic um, was one thing. Je Bob Rock was another and he didn't have any tolerance for it. Yeah. So we were all like kicked out of the studio when one person was performing. and. Um, and I think Jim and Steve both went to their corners, literally their corners of the house. <laughs> they also surfed, but they went to their corners yeah. of the house and sort of didn't come out. And um, and Nina and I, while we, our, while we came back together over the course of that summer, the guys didn't feel as much a part of the band anymore. And Steve said he kind of felt the band breaking up, the beginning of the end that mm. summer. 
Um, and, um, and so, you know, and, and, and while we, the Nina and I sort of came back together as, as, as a unified front, we didn't, we no longer had Jim, and he decided to leave the band at that point, right after we finished recording. So we didn't actually tour with him on Eight Arms to Hold mm -hmm. You, um, but we were already, we were moving so fast, so forward so quickly, and with such impetus at that time, that we just needed to find another person who wanted to be in the band, and that's all we could see. You know, we didn't, we didn't have time to, like, try to, you know, beg Jim to keep him in the band, or keep, beg Jim to stay in the band, or anything, or really work on that relationship and that dynamic. We could only see the record, the 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 date for a release of the album, and what we needed to do to get there. Yeah. And so um, the machine was, you know, was 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 in uh, in motion. Um, and so I think um, I feel like I'm I'm like jumping off of different thought threads here, but I think that's that was sort of the what led to that place of being on tour we had lost our drummer we call him the moral glue of the band right um, once he left it was like uh it, things things started to fall apart we had a lot of fun but things started to fall apart and and um you know we all kind of went off in our own weird journeys um and we weren't communicating we weren't anymore. Communicating. Not on tour either. You guys always presented a very, and I think maybe because you did interviews together. Um, oh, we had we were yeah. we were very close as friends. Oh, we were okay. very close. We were we were and, and it was and musically and it mm -hmm. wasn't even at the beginning. At the beginning, it was all fine. Mm -hmm. It was all fine. And the songs that we did end up doing together and on that record, we, we both felt great about. So that mm -hmm. was, I was just sort of describing a mood of the making of the demos, and okay. there was something there that led to what happened later. Mm -hmm. But when the record actually came to fruition, when we finished that album, when Nina and I basically said, okay, Bob, here are the reins, let's do this record, you do it how you want to do it. That, that was a huge weight off our shoulders because we didn't have to try to run the show. We didn't yeah. have to fight with Jim. We didn't have to fight with Steve. We didn't have to fight with each other. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we just did the record, and it was a relief because we could actually be healthy people living in Hawaii, enjoying ourselves, singing, and doing what we love most, and playing guitar, and finishing this album that we were so eager to finish. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing: being in a band is incredibly hard because if you, if you, if it's a democracy, which we uh, we set out to have. Um, if you've got four people with strong opinions and there's no director, there's no one person, there's no lead singer, it's you know a collaborative effort, then when you disagree, we had no system in place for how decisions got made. In the end, Louise and I felt we should make decisions because we were the ones writing the songs at the time um, and we were the front women. But being in a creative environment with four different people, it's it's too many cooks. Yeah. And, um, and I think a lot of bands that are made up of dudes have an easier time just saying, oh, that's a terrible idea. That sucks. Let's do mm -hmm. this. We're more like, sweetie, I don't know about <laughs> that. Um, maybe. And, um, you know, my boyfriend at the time said, oh, no, we just shoot each other down the whole time. Well, we weren't, we didn't want an environment like that. Mm -hmm. We didn't want to feel cut down and insulted. And that didn't work for us. It didn't work for us. They broke up, too. <laughs> right, right. No, they broke up. No, I know. But we've we've often talked about bands like you know with with incredible staying power. You know, you talk about like the Rolling Stones or something. Bands that are together for fifty years, yeah. and they had all kinds of drama and difficulty, and they got mad at each other, but they came back, you know, came back together because of the music, and probably also because I mean, definitely because of the money and the fact that they were a huge. You know, if you have a cash cow. And then, then the entire industry supports you staying together. In our situation, I'm jumping ahead. In our situation, had we had had we sold 11 million records, we may have stayed together because our management probably wouldn't have let us break up. Yeah. No. Our record label wouldn't have let us break up. <laughs> you know, if you are that, then everybody fights to keep you together. Mm -hmm. But in our situation, our second record didn't meet the expectations that everybody had for it. It did incredibly well in the grand scheme yeah. of things, but when when push came to shove and everything started to fall apart, they all let it fall apart. Right, and, and I have to backtrack to um, 
you know, my central motivation for starting a band with a woman and wanting a female band was to get out of that theater company that was a boys club. Mm -hmm. As much as I learned from it, as much as I treasure some of those friendships to date, it was really the, you know, the quintessential boys club. Yeah. It was run by men. They chose the plays. They were only like one to two female parts. And um, we all, all, all the women scrambled to get them. And, you know, and then I went to go see this agent and I could have just gotten a different agent who was more, you know, a better human being, but, um, you know, who saw that the head, the head shot in the crooked tooth and pointed out my flaw that I wasn't aware of having. And, um, you know, all of that was the, the, the impetus to get into a band, to start a band, to start, create my own art, to share my art with another woman was, was the be all and end all. I mean, that mm -hmm. was really the goal. And, um, we arrived to that together. We found that together. And then to be sort of that whole vision be sort of con distorted and contorted by all these um, all these outside influences, um, like, you know, and to have our unified front be fractured by circumstances outside of ourselves was such a cliche. It was such like, that's the thing that kills me. It's sort of like, yeah. we were holding the torch for women, for girls like you, who were in high school, who could see that women, you know, grown up women could be together, stay together, have a career together, be powerful and volcanic and whatever. Um, and have a unified voice and can make it that way. And we did not, you know, mm. we splintered and we fell apart. And there were all these outside, again, like there was no one person, there was no one force, but it all infiltrated our friendship and our business relationship uh, suffered for it. And then of course, ultimately it was our friendship that suffered for it. Um, not in the end, but you know, for, for a long time, uh, a long period. And, um, and, 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 you know, and as I was saying earlier also about listening to Nina sing and loving her songs and feeling like I was saying that universally speaking, I feel like it is, and this is the risk of sounding incredibly pretentious, I think it's our, the responsibility of the artist to produce and to create and to offer, you know, mm -hmm. to make the, the artist's unique offering that only he or she can make. And, um, and that's, then, then the rest is none of their business, you know? <laughs> it's just like, whatever people say about it, who cares? Yeah. The, our only job is to show up, to write the songs, to record them, put them out there, and then to make the next record, you yeah. know? And that's what we didn't have the foresight, um, you know, the breadth of knowledge um, to understand. Um, we didn't know that really it was just, we were just making records. If I could see, like if someone were to say, and shine a light on that moment, at that point, and say, Louise, this is just a moment in time, and you are making your second record right now. You guys are going to fall apart for a little bit, and then you'll get back together. Just make your next record, like, and and let all these little things are so small. They're small potatoes in the big picture. Like, just keep your eye on the prize, really. And this is the prize, like, and <laughs> our music and what we do together. Um, I, you know, of course, things had to happen the way they did, but we we didn't we didn't have the maturity and the and the understanding. Or, yeah, it's, I know. Or the support. Or the support. the support. And we had people, men, you know, this is not to vilify all the men in our lives, but whispering in our ears mm. and kind of poisoning, poisoning us against each other. Yeah. And um, nobody said, except for Dennis Dennehy, who was our publicist after the fact, had said, you know, if you were making Keith, you guys would have just, like you know, beaten each other up and gotten back together and made music because yeah. that's what you love to do. And and the moment we did get back together after 15 years of not singing together, it was both of us cried and felt so much regret. And just relief. Like, and re huge relief, but so much sadness about, like, why? Why did we, why? It mm. was so, pre this was so precious. And, um, and I was not able to create in that way. Yes, I, I made solo records, but it was never, it was never the same. So um, there were, there were people in our lives, not, not, you know, through no fault of theirs, people were whispering, people had, and the thing is, if you have two songwriters in a band and you, and you don't collaborate, then there are Nina songs and there are Louise songs. Yeah. And different people are going to be, they're going to like the Louise songs or they're going to like the Nina songs. And so the Nina song people are whispering, saying, you know, you know, it's like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, like Slugworth or whatever, like whispering in your ear and saying, like, come over here. And I think that's, that's, that separated us long before we even, we even broke up. We had our boyfriends who were, like, supporting us and... 
it um, there was just like little bits of poison and then there's all the all the like it started out as fun we were rock stars we were out there and we were on the road and there were drugs and there were dudes and we thought like we thought we could um, play the same game that all the guys in rock bands played mm -hmm. And maybe it works for them, but it did not work for us. We were not those people, and we had softer, um, softer skin, and and I don't know. We just didn't have that kind of stamina. Swagger. We, we didn't have it. We didn't. <laughs> Swagger. We didn't. We were not. We were not. We were not that. We are. No. We are thinking, feeling, passionate, and compassionate women. Mm -hmm. You know. So the, like yeah. So the. The we tried. We tried yeah, to, we to do that. And we, we that made a good... Is talking about that Jim is the moral compass? Because I heard that that last tour blue. was like crazier than yes, yes. any of the other tours. Yes, and part of it has to do with the influence of bands that we went on tour with. Okay. Um, and I was at your last show, which I didn't know was your last in show. Boston. At the time, with the olives. Oh, can you say <gasps> that with olives. your dad? Sorry. <laughs> She hates the olives. And my, my mom was with me, and she was like, I think she's throwing olives. Why did she have <laughs> olives in I her was still, I was still it's too so young. Wrong. I couldn't get in by myself. Oh, that's like, <laughs> boy, that's like the, But you know what? The nice thing about that night, it was our last show, but I met my husband that night. Oh, you did? I don't remember meeting oh. him, but he remembers meeting me. <laughs> and do you know, fun, strangely, um, another New Year's Eve story for you. Mm -hmm. I met my husband, my then future husband, mm -hmm. on New Year's Eve in Chicago. Yeah, when we played oh. the double door. Yep. That's really weird that years. all of those uh -huh. things happen. It's easy to remember though. Mm -hmm. You can put it in your log. Mm -hmm. New Year's Eve. <laughs> but yeah, that um Jim was Jim was the moral glue. Certainly for me because he was my brother and it, mm -hmm. and and um and just for all of us. He he didn't, you know, Jim has a lot of um disdain for a lot of ways of being and um He's a lovely guy, but he definitely makes you feel a little like certain things are acceptable, certain words are acceptable to use in songs, and certain words are not. <laughs> embarrassed and ashamed. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> embarrassed and ashamed. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so he left, and things kind of, you know, all hell kind of broke loose. And again, yeah. it had to do with the people we were touring with, and um, you know, and and again, we made it. We we made a good go of it. I mean, we definitely tried to live that way and it just didn't work for us and mm -hmm. ultimately became a wedge between us. Um, what was there one or who approached who about I don't want to do this anymore. I read that it was Nina but again you guys don't talk about it that much which I think is really nice. <laughs> you don't go into so it's kind of like a mystery. I mean I want to know but <laughs> like what you know I mean just who Nina Nina was upset with me, and she decided she wasn't didn't want to play together anymore. Okay, um, and then you you kept the Baruch Assault name. Mm -hmm. like, I mean, I followed you know the, all the in between. I mm -hmm. I always knew that you would get back together. So you didn't? <laughs> oh, I always knew. I it. didn't. I mean, it was heartbreaking for I me didn't. when it happened, but I was like, you know, so just fifteen years of sadness and borderline <laughs> depression, but. <laughs> But I Sorry feel better that. now. No, it's okay. No, it was all right. That's probably why I started drinking so much. Oh, <laughs> like, no. Maybe it's Bruce Assault's fault. I don't know. <laughs> the influence we ended up having. Yeah. Oh, See? Um, but what made you decide to keep the name or to attempt to continue Bruce Assault on your own? Um, well, I wasn't ready for it to be done. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I couldn't accept what I felt like was the failure of the band breaking up. And mm. I, I, it was sort of like, um, you know, I was imagined, you know, growing up, buying records, going to the record stores, buying vinyl. I was imagined like all the Ruger Salt records yeah. there would be, just like all the B-52 records when I got Whammy and, <laughs> and Private Idaho and whatever. I forgot all the names now, but when I would go get all these records, that's what I, and Prince and everybody, that's what I dreamed that we would have. And, um, and so part of it was that, part of it was like, I don't want this to be over. And I really, in my heart, didn't want this to be over, yeah. of course. And I was also um, afraid of doing it on my own. And and I think, I think there were a lot of different things at play. I was angry. I was angry at Nina for layers of things, things that I've addressed, I've talked about in here, and, and then things that happened on tour. Um, um, 
we had not been communicating for a long time at that mm -hmm. point and and what felt like a long time was probably like a few months but yeah. it felt like a long time um, and so it was it was reven it was vengeful and vindictive um, it was although I wouldn't have acknowledged that at the time yeah no. <laughs> um, and I was I was really hurt mm -hmm. and so for that same reason it was a response to that it was reactionary and um, I had people whispering in my ear you've worked so hard for this name it's you know it's a it's it's a trademark now you you know you you should keep this business going and and why go off on your own and start over essentially mm -hmm. and um, that's a really sore spot for me because in hindsight I would I would have done it differently were I to do it again but I didn't and now I need to embrace that too you know because mm -hmm. I can't spend my life regretting what I did and um, and again hopefully it'll all come out in the wash and it's a happy ending and um, I like that you refer to that time period now as Veruca Starship. I thought it was really <laughs> hilarious. I mean, well, I mean, what would have been really to, smart like, is split it up. was yeah. to, if I had actually called it that. Like that would have been genius. Yeah, Unfortunately, I didn't learn about Starship until years later. We, oh no. Yeah, we. My, my brother and I referred to it as Starship while it was all going on. It was uh, sort of like, okay, Veruca Salt, Veruca Starship, because you have to delineate somehow, mm -hmm. and you do. Mm -hmm. um, um, were you? I feel really bad asking these questions. You can ask okay. them. I know. Fine. We've, we've, For we've, posterity. We're all good. Okay. Um, were you upset that Louise kept the name and like sang songs like Seether? Because I saw you as Bruca Starship as well. <laughs> <laughs> I would go. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw, uh, I don't remember, it was kind of, I, there's a yeah. lot I don't remember mm -hmm. between like mm -hmm. 2001 and 2007. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, okay. But I went. Mm -hmm. um, was there any resentment there that she was playing the songs that you wrote for Bruca Salt? There, uh, I, I, no, there wasn't resentment about that. There, wa there definitely was, um, but it was hurt as well. We were both really wounded by each mm -hmm. other. We, we, we were both in the same place emotionally. Um, I was, I was hurt by that because, um, you know, I walked away. I was the one who walked away, so I knew, I knew I was walking away, but I didn't think I was walking away from the name because I really thought the name was the two of us. Mm -hmm. um, but I knew I was willing to walk away from the name because it's like leaving a marriage. Like if you want to get out quickly, you're going to pay for it. You know what I mean? I yeah. didn't want to fight about it. I didn't want to communicate at all. I wanted to just get out. So I did. And that's, this is what happened. And I now understand why it made perfect sense for her to, you know, given that trajectory, it, it made sense. And, at the time, it 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 hurt me. It it did. It hurt me because I still felt, even though everything fell apart, I still felt like we created it together. It was our baby, and so it felt like someone else is raising my child without my influence. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. um, yeah, that must feel horrible. Yeah. So that that was really really hard. Um, and, and that, by the way, that haunted me like the whole time. I knew that in my heart, I knew this was hurting Nina. So it wasn't like I wake up like, yeah, another day of hurting Nina. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was like I began hurting myself because I was in so much pain and knowing that she, I was hurting her. Like it was not a healthy situation. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't, it wasn't a healthy self-caring choice that I made. And people in my life who loved me at the time, who weren't in the industry, said, like, Louise, why don't you just drop the baggage? It's like, drop the rocks and swim to the surface. Mm. You know, start over, <laughs> clean slate. Um, they really encouraged me to not keep the name, but I was holding on so tightly. And, you know, it's like that thing where you're so angry and you're holding on to this burning ember that you want to throw at someone, but you're the one that gets burned. Yeah. And I was just sitting there hurting myself while doing it. Like, the choice I made, and I was, but I was so angry, like, I couldn't see past the anger. And all of these emotions, but I and so it wasn't a a cleansing, healthy self care time. You know, yeah. it was more like implosion. And so knowing that it was hurting her was was also um, really toxic for me. You know, mm -hmm. um, I just want to interject that because there wasn't like some there wasn't like this some joy I was experiencing over more her. like carefree. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was more like uh, you know, like let's keep this momentum going and just denying what the truth of it was to me, which was that I, I you know, I would stay awake nights not feeling good about this. Mm -hmm. And um, and the reason I played those songs live is because if I didn't, I got so much shit from the promoters and all the way down the chain, like I'd start getting calls. Well, and the crowd, too. And the I crowd, mean, right. So, like, it was like, yeah. Yeah. 
So, and I tried to do different versions of them to make it interesting for me, and um, that didn't really, like, scratch the itch that everyone had. And um, so by keeping the name, I had to. I mm -hmm. had to play the singles. I remember when I saw um, Resolver had just come out, mm -hmm. and number one, I heard it, and I was like, oh, shit, like, I really like that, you know, and even post-Nina, so it was hard to listen to. It was hard for me, but I did it. Um, but, yeah, there are songs that are... <laughs> very directly yeah, about well, <laughs> the things that happen. And then you have a couple too, Black yeah, and Blonde. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and on that record, Polaroid or Number One Camera. And we mm -hmm. both, I mean, I remember listening to Resolver at the gym, you know, listening yeah, to these Yeah, it's like, oh, that's like, definitely oh, about me. <laughs> is that me or is that him? Is that me or is that about him? Is that about him? And she had the exact same experience. Yeah. Is it him or is it me? But I, interestingly or not, like Nina and I were still inspiring each other, possibly some of our best art from yeah. across... Oh yeah, the yep. state yeah. or Definitely. the city or the country, and like Definitely. I loved Number One Camera. It was like mm -hmm. me too. My favorite, so my favorite songs on Resolve. I read that in an like, interview yeah. that your favorite songs on each other's were the records meanest were the ones meanest. about us. <laughs> yes. like, Wait, what was your favorite one? Do you know the one about? <laughs> well, I loved, I loved Only You Know. Mm -hmm. I thought it was. I mean, only you know, and then, and used to know her, and I <laughs> Jesus. mean, come on. That's like my favorite. Come I, on. I would even feel bad listening to it. No, like, don't feel bad. It was great. I mean, yeah. that's the thing. So yes, we, we were able to somehow pick up the pieces and make, and make music. Mm -hmm. Um, but I remember listening to those and just being like, holy <laughs> shit. I Somebody wants to interject into that. I, I should hate this, but I love this, you know? It's like, it's pretty intense. So, um. But now we get to make music together again and inspire each other. I know. It's fantastic. Yeah. I know. I can't believe I'm sitting here. <laughs> um, and, you, I mean, you don't have to go on. Um, do you, I mean, did you have any, or just any, any, uh, just about your solo career? Well, uh, there was one album that you recorded that wasn't released at all. Yeah. Um, um, well, so, you know, in that whole period... And during Eight Arms to Hold You, um, touring, yeah, I I was just about to be 30, I guess I was 29, and I started acting out a lot in lots of different ways, and um, yeah, there were painkillers, there was, there were all kinds of drugs, and, um, and also just irresponsible behavior, you know, cheating on my boyfriend, whom I, you know, I loved a lot, and, um, just all kinds of stuff that was, you know, the, the trappings of being in a rock band. And it all seems kind of fun and funny now, um, but it wasn't so funny. It was fun, mm -hmm. um, but um, but I think, um, you know, part of it is, first of all, being on the road is, is boring most yeah. of the day. And there's a reason that drugs and, and touring go together. Like, it, it actually... On a, in moderation, it's actually a combination that works really well, you know what I mean? <laughs> Ideally, like, I'm sure there are a lot of people out there who can do that, you know? I don't know. Um, who can do that, you know, drink in a recreational way or do drugs in a recreational way and have fun on the road. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure that can work really well. And I think for a while it did and then it didn't. Um, and then my, I didn't really have the same battles. My battles were more just sort of emotional, um, and, um, you know, just the aftermath of the breakup was extremely sad and difficult, but I was sort of fueled by the idea that, like, I had to put out a solo record and I was going to get it out there, and I did pretty well with that structure. The fact that coming off of that second Veruca Salt album, um, my label and management, they were all supportive. They kept, you know, like kept going. And I went and recorded with Bob Rock again. And that was all a, kind of a great time, except that it was sad. And I still was in a lot of pain, obviously, in a huge amount of pain. My brother came out. And so I had like my brother helping me a little bit with that album. And that was nice. But um, then, then, uh, yeah, then music just kind of, I did make a second a second record but it was harder you know it was harder there was a big space between yeah. those records and it was harder and harder to make it happen without um without structure without louise um and life took a different kind of course i i 
I, Jeff and I got together and I really wanted to have children and that became kind of a longer mm -hmm. journey than I had expected and um, and music be kind of faded into the background. Um, I was never happy about that, but it just did. And I didn't have a machine behind me saying like, you gotta get this out, you gotta do this. And um, <clears throat> So I made a second record and I was eight months pregnant when it came out, and oh, nobody no way. really, yeah, I and mean, nobody really cared. And my label, I was on Warner Brothers at the time, and they were sort of like relieved to not have to spend any money, I think, oh. on the record because they had this great excuse, which was I was pregnant, and there was no way I was just so you couldn't tour. tour or anything. Yeah, oh. and um, and everyone just kind of let me go, and I just you know let it pass, and um, now feel like oh that's kind of sad because th that record was you know that. That took a lot of work, and I'm proud of it, but whatever. And then for years, I didn't write music. Music was just kind of gone, and it was sort of like a, um, it was a similar thing to, oh, you know, maybe we should ask my dad. <laughs> family. Oh, you you tell me we come back if yeah. we're not going to. Do you want me to just okay. tell him real quick? Sure. Mm -hmm. well, oh, okay. is he, or I don't know Maybe he's is. in with Brad now, I don't know. Yeah. But I feel like I don't want him to feel. Do you want to, do you want to? Yeah, let me know. Oh, <laughs> okay. I'm so sorry. Oh, um, you got um, married. Oh, yeah. Uh, kids. Um, yeah. So, well, I mean, and this comes up a lot, too. Just, did you feel like um, that you had to make a choice between playing music and being a mother? Or did it just kind of happen that way? Like, you got married, had kids, and it just falls by the wayside. Yeah, it just kind of went on to the back burner. And, um... It definitely was gnawing at me the whole time. Um, I was happy to to be a mother. I am happy to be a mother. It's it's the greatest thing in the world. But um, but I always you know every time I would see people and they'd say, "What are you doing? Are you writing music?" No, I haven't really. No, I can't really get it together. I can't really you know I don't have any time and. There are women who do it. There yeah. are lots and lots of women who do it, who are able to be creative and be young, you know, parents, young mothers, um, new mothers, I should say. And um, and I somehow just couldn't do it. My whole process was about having endless time ahead of me, you know, write a few lines of a song, take a nap, write a few li more lines, take another nap, <laughs> maybe get something to eat, you know, stay up until three in the morning writing. Um, and sleeping all day, you know, and that, so you just can't, and, and friends of mine would say, well, you need to get a space, like get a studio somewhere and go and spend three, you know, three hours out of your day, just go, or two times a week or whatever, make a schedule, and that's just not who I am. I, yeah. I, I've never been that person, and I never understood how you could, <laughs> I have alarms to remind me to do things. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, but um, I'm just going to turn that off one second. But, um... Yeah, no, I, that's just never been me, and I feel like in order to create, you need hours and hours and hours and hours of endless time and no pressure, mm -hmm. and the idea of scheduling songwriting time seemed crazy to me, and so I just kind of let it slide, and I think also part of um, being a mother, a new mother, it was also an excuse in a way, you know, we were talking about my difficulty sort of getting out there and doing these things and sort of needing Louise to push me yeah. to do it. So without Louise or anyone in my life that was like that, um, I was sort of happy to have a role that I could play mother and not feel like I'm not doing it. It's not like I'm sitting around doing nothing all day, yeah. you know, and so I could feel good about myself and not have to, not have to be, um, be creative in that way and writing songs but it did gnaw at me and um, I didn't realize how important it was until we started doing it again mm -hmm. um, and how much you know a huge part of me that is and um, you know, you've been artistically dormant for so long for a long at time at that point yeah. yeah me too yeah yeah I think that's why there's less I mean because I think you did a, a lot more like back-to-back uh, or there were more no, really. She, well, she played shows, and I did not play shows. Yeah. I, did I, did I did not tour. Mm. I did tour. Were there four? No. Ruka Starship. No, there were two and an EP. 
Oh, that's it? Just two in the evening? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. And in fact, this, another uncanny thing about our being apart was that they, our two records, full-length records, came out within months of each other. Both oh, times. Right. Both times. Like, we oh. both waited a huge, there was a huge <laughs> gap between the two. Yeah. Yeah. It was so like, we like were really in sync, even though we were completely yeah. apart. Yeah. That's so extreme. Yeah. Incredible. Um, okay, and then you're married and you have one, you have a daughter. Yeah. Um, so after you got healthy again, you're still playing, um, and just, I mean, yeah, you just seem like such a performer. So I guess same question for you. Did you, did you want children? Um, did you think that you could have children and still play in a band? Um, did it just happen for you two? Like it kind of just happened for Nina, you meet somebody and... <laughs> get married and <laughs> um I always wanted children I always mm. imagined because my mom had me at 28 that I'd have like if I'd start by by the time I was 28 oh yeah <laughs> yeah but we were busy we yeah were just beginning really well imagine busy. if you'd had a kid oh my god then yep yeah. <laughs> and people do me too yeah I know. it's not that great <laughs> um I um Met my husband to be, as I mentioned, when we played a show at the Double Door in Chicago in, in um, like 94, 94, 95. But I didn't re meet re meet him until like 2000. Oh, okay. And um, we got together, and I remember we were getting loaded in the back of the bus, and I said, "I don't want you to. Th we're not going one step further unless you tell me you want children." <laughs> oh. <laughs> and um, he said. I want a daughter. And oh, a daughter? He That's said he specific. He wanted a daughter. <laughs> and <laughs> still get one at like, the daughter yeah. store. He said, "I've always imagined I would, I would like to have a daughter." Hmm. And I said, "Okay, that's good enough. Let's do this." <laughs> <laughs> okay. And um, and so that <laughs> scene. And then you Cut wrote it in your log. Log. <laughs> daughter, check. <laughs> I may have made him commit to more children at that time. Mm -hmm. I feel I seem to remember that I did. He claims I didn't. That he only he only committed to one person, yeah. da one daughter, <laughs> um, one child. That being a daughter. Um, but um, so, but then you know, as as time wore on, and we were the relationship because we met on the road. We were the relationship that was never meant to happen. Mm -hmm. We were like people were laying down money that we'd break up by the end of the oh. tour. <laughs> Like, this was not going to be the lasting relationship because we were both involved with other people. Mm -hmm. um, that was not the case. And um, years later, I was, I've never told Nina this story, so I was on my way to, I was getting in a van, loading gear in a van, and just gotten in the van to go play a show in Las Vegas in, well, you would know the date better than I, um, and not feeling it anymore, like not feeling the fight in me to keep the name going, to keep the band going, like I just wasn't, I mean I still had music in coming, you know, I was still creating and I was still, I, I was exhausted from it, like and, and what I really wanted was to start a family. Mm -hmm. And at this point, um, my boyfriend then of many years was reluctant to have children, reluctant to get married, and, um, and I was on my way to the show, and we had this, I think it was my guitar player, told me as we sat down that he had heard that Nina was having a baby. And I, I, want, uh, all, I had such a, you know, a rush of emotion, like, of course, joy for her because mm -hmm. I knew that this is what she wanted. And... Um, pain, like central pain, because I knew it's what I wanted. Mm -hmm. And she being a reflection of me, even after years of not seeing her, and I was, I think I was 39 at that time, um, or something like that, and I was thinking, of, you know, my, the window's closing, and, and what am I doing? I'm going to go play a show in Las Vegas. Like, who cares about this, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and um, at some point after that, you know, I became clear that I that that's what I wanted, and like playing and writing music fell into the background. And at some point after that, um, I don't know, I can't remember the time frame exactly, but maybe a year later, um, 
I found myself pregnant and my husband dragged me to Vegas, back to Vegas, mm -hmm. and um, a few people flew out. My brother gave me away. His brother was the best man and we got married and, um, and then I miscarried. And it was like, it was the most devastating thing to date in my life. And um, I'm suddenly talking about this. And six months later, Nina and I, who were at this point in touch via email, um, were in touch. And um, I had shared with her that just following the miscarriage, my husband had um, a leg-threatening series of emergency surgeries. And um, he still has his leg, but we didn't know if he would keep it at the time. He had something called compartment syndrome. And so we got married, and then these sort of tragedies befell us. Oh. And um, I, months later, Nina was privy to what happened with my husband. I, I had included her in, in all of that. And uh, months later, I, I emailed her. We were emailing about something, and I intimated to her that I'd had a miscarriage. And, um, and Ivy was born at that point, right? Mm -hmm. She was... And you weren't pregnant with Charlie yet, but Ivy was born. I don't know, like maybe it. <clears throat> maybe you were pregnant with Charlie. I don't know. I don't remember the timing. Mm -hmm. But um. But she, she wrote back, "Me too." Oh. And, and she knew exactly what I was going through, and it was like. It was such an incredible gift to me. Mm -hmm. That she understood. And she proceeded to be, from that moment on, what she called my pregnancy sponsor, and was there for me around every juncture, and around every corner. And I went on to have two more miscarriages, and then I had my daughter. Oh, okay. And Nina was there for me throughout all of it, for every, every pregnancy test, every procedure, um, negative or positive, she was cheerleading when I had my amnio. Amnios are now obsolete. <laughs> it's such a joke that, that we had to go through that. <laughs> did you go through that? I did, yeah. Oh, okay. oh, I remember you telling me it's not that bad, and I was like, that was pretty bad. Um, <laughs> and 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 she was there when when the pregnancy test was getting more, you know, less faint, more positive, more mm -hmm. darker every day, and was there for me throughout that pregnancy journey and when um, the, the results were in and she was a healthy baby girl and um, and then you know, of course when she was born and then so that was the beginning of our the relationship of the renewing of our relationship and that really catapulted us back into friendship mm -hmm. and it was it was sisterhood at its it's in its basis form, you know, right. its most fundamental form. And you still hadn't seen each other. We hadn't seen each other. We were just supporting each other. For years we had been in, a, been in touch in this very sort of distant way via email. Maybe on my birthday I would get an email from Louise. On her birthday, which is two weeks after, I would, um, I would send an email. If we would see something that we thought the other would be interested in, you know, something, you know, a band or something or just a, some anything, we would send a little email, but it was always very kind of distant. Mm -hmm. It was never, how are you? Should we get together? Do you want to get together? I mean, that yeah. was never even, and there was nothing really personal. Um, but then when Louise um, emailed me about her husband, and in that email, said, you know, it was a difficult time, I had a miscarriage, it was devastating. I felt like, okay, I, I want to share this with her because I have a lot of information about this. Mm -hmm. She was still, I think, you know, she, she wanted to have a baby and um, I had had three miscarriages before Ivy. So it's, it's funny, we now laugh about like the whole idea of women in rock and how, um, you know, and, and, and the sadness about the content of our breakup and feminism and not being there for each other and betraying each other and all that. And then in the end, um, you know, one doesn't really know, you know, when, when you go through something like a miscarriage, you don't, uh, 
you have no idea why it's happening to you, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I would look around and see all these women with babies and I was like, I don't understand, it's so easy for them and why is it so easy for them and so hard for me? And I really didn't think it was gonna happen for me. I, had, I was 38 years old and I'd had three, or however old I was, and I had, had three miscarriages and I thought, oh, I'm just broken, like this is not mm -hmm. gonna work. And, um, and why, why, why are you putting me through this? Why am I being put through this? And so when I got this email from Louise, all of a sudden my heart opened up to her in a way that all those years since our breakup, it had never been open. It was like, I still felt like if I bumped into her on the street, I would have given her a hug, but there would have been a wall, mm -hmm. you know? And then when she wrote to me about her miscarriage, it was like, all of a sudden my heart just opened and I thought, I want to, I want to help her. Mm -hmm. I want to tell her about my experience and what I know about it and you know and so yeah you know I became her pregnancy sponsor because I knew every I knew every doctor in the city I knew I knew well, exactly what you need to do to have a baby everything if you want to have a baby and it's not working you know and so um and we sh we had the same OB as it turns out. Oh right, out. we did. Oh right, <laughs> so right. weird. I yeah, know. yeah. <laughs> but anyway, weird. the the desire to be um, to be a mother was mm. what brought us back together and what enabled us to to be in each other's lives in a in a in a really substantial and meaningful way again. And so um, so we would talk on the phone. She would share every and, and but it still stayed on this very kind of medical level, you know, it really yeah. wasn't, the music still was not being talked about at all. It occurred to me that Nina might be pursuing a career as a doctor, because <laughs> she was so well informed, <laughs> yeah. she was so articulate about medicine and about, you know, gynecological medicine, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that I thought this woman, if she's not going medical school, probably yeah. should be. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I was, there. I was, <laughs> having had all this, spent all the time, this time in the hospital with my husband, and then with my own stuff, like I had under, become to understand the value of nurses, and mm -hmm. I began to, and I began to think, all right, how many years could I, <laughs> how many years would it take, and do I have time, and could I, maybe I'll, that's maybe that's my next career, yeah. and I actually went to an orientation, and I got pregnant with Lila, and I just couldn't imagine, I couldn't imagine like taking, spending her, you know, my pregnancy and her first couple of years in nursing school or yeah. her first year, so like it wasn't going to happen. But I'm glad it didn't. I know. I think <laughs> that's really what. But then that's what happened. Yeah. No, no, just do yeah. this. this <laughs> but so we were talking, and I and I can't. I mean, I will never ever forget when Louise texted me. You know, when when I got the news that Lila was born and healthy, it was like, it it was. I mean, it was really, I don't even know how to explain it. I was mm. so happy, so relieved. So, I mean, we'd been through all of that together. And I I just, I've never been happier for another person. I was yeah. so thrilled. And, um, and so, you know, I do feel like there is a beauty in, and, and again, all those years of me saying, why me, why me? Now I realized, okay, maybe this was, this is why, this is why I had those miscarriages because I never would have, I don't know that I ever would have opened my heart again, mm -hmm. you know? And so that's what opened the door. And then in time, when Mazzy Star were playing at um, Coachella, I thought, I want, I gotta, I, I, we gotta, we gotta play again. It's not, you know, they, they were apart for 15 years, now they're doing it. We need to be playing. And so we just decided. Oh, you're, you're the one who approached yeah. Louise with the idea. Yeah. Well, she had, you had, I think, in, so, in one email you had said something about it. Mm -hmm. I, thought, I think I did. I but I kind I of, I was still too closed off. This was pre-baby stuff. Okay. I was still just kind of closed off. My yeah, but it was also kind of like, it was a... I'd let, I, in thinking about it now, it seems sort of half-hearted, like, like a, an ex-boyfriend of mine um, proposed to me. I've been proposed to a few times. <laughs> they were all shitty proposals. Like, one guy, you know, a couple, like, sort of, like, drunk guys in my kitchen, like, do you think maybe we could? I'm like, uh, you know, <laughs> no. no. Thanks. Yeah, you know, like, what? What'd you say? Did you just propose to me? But this, this boyfriend who, um, I got to, who I got together with on the heels of our breakup, my breakup with Nina, um, and the other breakup with the dude, um, <laughs> the dude, <laughs> the dude. Um, 
he said, he's like, yeah, we should just get married. We should go to Vegas and get married. I'm like, no, that's not how we're doing it. I ended up doing that that way with someone else. But, um, but it was a half-hearted, I remember thinking that's a half-hearted proposal. Like yeah. you don't mean business. And I, I think that I didn't have the real, the really the nerve or, you know, I hadn't made amends to you. I hadn't like, I hadn't come to the place where it was really the right time for either of us. But I think that I, I, on, I knew that on, on some level, of course, that that I did want to play music with you, that I would love to play music with you again. And I just hadn't, you know, I wasn't ready to take it beyond Vegas, like, <laughs> to make it real, you know? Right. What's the expression you always used to use about burning the field? Oh, you know, yeah. in crops, where you have to burn the field yeah. in order to start, an, new. start yeah. anew. So, a year before this happened, the, the, the music started to happen again, and I, had, I approached Louise about playing music again. We dissolved the Veruca Salt LLC. So for all oh. those years we were apart, we still had a company together. We just oh. never got around to it. Like, we had people paying taxes for us, and we hadn't... We'd never dissolved the band. We'd never signed papers that actually dissolved the band. Nor had oh. I started a new LLC for the new Veruca Salt, yeah. you know? like. It was just a, it was a very strange right. situation. So we finally got around to it. We were like, we got to break up this band. This was 15 years, I mean, this yeah. was 15 years later. <laughs> we're like, we got to break it. This is ridiculous. We got to break up the band. So we finally <laughs> individually all signed the papers, right? Mm -hmm. And then a year later, this <laughs> light bulb goes off. It's like, I want to play music with her again. Let's do it. And now we got the band back together. We had to form a new LLC. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's so pain. dumb. So dumb. The whole yeah. thing is so but dumb. We had to dismantle it down to nothing in order yeah. for it to, to, re to, right. in order to reform. Right. There is that saying. I don't remember exactly what it is, but... But isn't there a, yeah, a method yeah. of, of farming? Just like you have to get rid of all... Like clean house, like get rid of all the old stuff right. before you can right. start over. Well, yeah, right. burn the fields. Burn Steve, the fields. Yeah. Steve Black told me that expression in order for the new harvest. Oh, okay. Yeah, Plant the new harvest. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then you, well, speaking of Steve Black, because then you had to kind of like talk him into it. Yeah, we didn't have to talk him into it. He was you know, all for it. Well, he was, he, he surprised himself by being on board because yeah. for years he had been off the grid, no one knew what he was doing. There were rumors that he had died. Nina heard this rumor, oh and, um, and and was of course horrified and terrified. Steve and Jim reached out to Steve and found out that he was in fact still alive. Oh. And, um, but Steve was. Um, I hadn't. I I heard. I, I heard various things about him. It was all sort of mythology at this point. Like where what has happened to him? Mm. And um, he um, he resurfaced a couple years prior to our seeing each other. I, I sought him out and um, really just Facebook made it easier because I reconnected with his sister and then I found him and I got together with him and his wife and um, and and you know then retained contact with him after that mm -hmm. um, maintained contact with him just here and there but when um, when Nina and I got together and had dinner for, saw each other for the first time in 14 years we we talked about playing music, and and I later that summer saw Steve and asked him if um, I was down in San Diego and I had lunch with him, and I said if we were to get together and we were to try to play music again, would you be interested? And he paused and, and he said, I've I've been wondering for years what my answer would be to this question, <laughs> and it's yes. <laughs> And I didn't know what it would be, but it's yes. Mm -hmm. And I think he had decided he wasn't going to play bass ever again. And he decided, it, and he stuck to that for about ten years, and um, and or twelve years, and um, and uh, strangely, similar to Jim, and and I don't know about us and guitars, but may possibly songwriting. Like everyone's, everyone's better. <laughs> And uh, because we weren't done when we, you know, when we broke up, we mm -hmm. weren't done creatively. Um, interpersonally, we fell apart, but our friendship also wasn't done. It was just a, it was an unfortunate occurrence of events, and and that we couldn't hold it together, and that we needed to break apart. We weren't we weren't done creatively as a band. Um, 
I would I would guess Jim would say the same. He left, but he part of him wishes that he would have stayed to make the next Baruch Assault record. Mm -hmm. And it was his baby too, you know? It was very much his band too. And um and so we all have I'm sure we'll get there, you know, in your line in your questioning, but we all really fell in so naturally with one another and found that we had so much more we have found and are still finding that we have so much more to to do together. There's so much more to create and so many more songs to write, and they're all happening really naturally. Mm -hmm. um, and you said your songwriting process is a little bit different now. Um, you don't kind of covet <laughs> what you've written so much anymore. You work more together. And I actually read that, um, Nina, you said something that's more for convenience purposes because <laughs> you'll like send a song and oh, I have to bring the kids to school. Can you write a bridge for this song? Well, yeah. Or like write a it's chorus? It's kind of so. started out that way. I think it's just of necessity. There's a feeling of, um, you know, you just, yeah, we, there's just not that much time. So if someone else has, a, has an idea and it's coming quicker, we don't have to be precious about it. Mm -hmm. And also I think, you know, when you're in your 20s, women in their 20s, well, I don't want to make generalizations, but I was crazy. I'll just say that. I was okay. cuckoo. And there's this feeling of, you know, being a young artist, poet, writer, you know, I felt like my voice had to be heard on every level. It was sort of like I had to, you know, every little feeling that I had was precious and worthy of, you know, <laughs> Every, every, whatever appreciation and you know from my boyfriend from my family from from my band from whatever it was and then once we got this sort of band going and it was like oh I get to make records and I get to it's like this is my this is my baby this is my and then kind of you know once you get a little bit older it's not that the music is any less important it's not we still have really high standards for what we're doing. It's not like we're like, ah, it's a throwaway. Mm -hmm. Who cares? Or we're just phoning it in. We're taking it really seriously, but it isn't so deeply personal on an individual level. Yeah. It's like I don't for my survival, yeah. I don't need to I don't need to be the the sole owner of this thought and yeah. this idea <laughs> and this sentiment. It's like we can share that together. And, and we can share it with Jim and Steve. And, um, and so I think that's actually, I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge relief. And to write that way, um, we still get to have the, the satisfaction, the feeling of, you know, creating and, and um, performing. But it, it just doesn't have the same, wouldn't you agree? It doesn't have that same, um, it's not as loaded. It's yeah. just not as loaded. Hopefully it's as, every bit as good and as passionate um, because the passion is there. It's just, it's not, it doesn't have that crazy early 20s. Mm -hmm. Well, we didn't know how mm -hmm. life was going to say quoi. Right. We didn't know how life was going to pan out at that time. Like we both knew that we had a, we had a, you know, it's how you draw your life up in the locker room. Like we had a vision for how things would ideally evolve. And then I think we both imagine ourselves eventually as mothers and happily married moms and um, living a healthy, prosperous life. We didn't know how we were going to get there, and we were definitely trying to make our mark as, as legitimate artists at mm -hmm. the time and, and finding our voices. And that was so important to us that um, having, a, having a partner and some, you know, hmm, we weren't as into co-writing lyrics because the sentiment had to be so uniquely ours because we were so fiercely trying to establish our own voice and find our own voice. So it felt threatening to have someone else possibly, you know, whatever, offering input. So we didn't, we actually never even did that with one another, or very rarely did that. Mm -hmm. When we did, it was a relief on a couple things like the Albini EP, because we weren't shouldering so much, you know, so much responsibility for our own identities. It was kind yeah. of like just cut loose and have fun in a band, you know? Yeah, even like switched off. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Songs, which was so much mm -hmm. fun, and those songs ended up being the songs that were the most fun to perform. They still mm -hmm. are, yeah. They still yeah. are. Yeah. They're the most fun, the trading off vocals, and then you feel, and, and there is something about the health of the band, you know, the whole thing that Vicki Peterson said about, you know, splintering or, you know, divisiveness, all of that kind of stuff, um, 
doesn't come into play as much if you're co-writing. Yeah. If you're writing individually, then there are Nina songs and Louise songs, and then you know you are going to have somebody at a label saying, "Oh, it's got to be this song," and uh, and then you know. Whereas if you're co-writing songs, then they're our songs, and they should have been our songs all along. And I think we, for the most part, felt that way. But yeah. of course. I'm going to have certain songs of Louise's that I love more than others. Mm -hmm. You know, she's going to have the same. But if we're writing together, it's like, yeah, it's co-ownership. And in a way, that's a healthier, it's a healthier relationship for us to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's just less burdensome. It's and really then you're not thinking when you're, um, when you're writing out a set list. Like, we would write out set lists, and there's always this sort of tension of, like, oh. it's got to be Nina's song, Louise's song, Nina's right. song, Louise's yeah, song. Like oh, wait, there numbers. are six of my songs and only four of hers. That's not okay. Let's flip it over. What should we, you know, whereas if we're both singing on them and we're both writing them together, then it's sort of like they're ours. It doesn't matter, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a relief. And it's a relief having written songs on my own for so long and shouldering the weight of keeping the name by myself, being, um, not having a partner. It's such a relief to be, you know, back together, sharing the songwriting responsibilities. I mean, I don't, I know that you have had a similar experience writing your albums and just, and just not having, you know, probably the liberating part, but the part and not, and then the, the kind of the lonely part and yeah. the sort of you know I felt adrift I felt like who cares if I write this song you know <laughs> <laughs> like I remember reading something from a fan on, on the internet and just going like and and someone saying like where's your next record I want to hear it and thinking oh somebody, somebody <laughs> wants to hear a record there were some oh, of my, us yeah. right. I didn't write it on the internet I just thought it I'm just putting it out putting there it I'm out not there. saying there were, that I didn't have fans and that Starship yeah. didn't have fans and that and also I, I feel like you know along those lines some of those fans have taken umbrage with my being so dismissive of those albums as Resolve albums because they oh, felt really? like I came on board during that time. Like I didn't mm -hmm. know the band before Resolver. Like why would you be so dismissive of? It feels it feels like they're t like they're they take it personally almost. Oh. You know. So anyway, just trying to navigate <laughs> yeah, these, un yeah. these unfamiliar waters. You know. Mm -hmm. But um, but God, what a relief! What a relief! Yeah. Can I just say on and also playing shows. What's so nice about this past tour this summer in Australia? As you do realize, it's so much nicer to have oh. somebody up there with you. So it's like, if I was having a bad show, I'd look over at Louise, and she was so in it, and I was like, great. Yeah, exactly. She's <laughs> taken over. It doesn't matter. Like, mm -hmm. I can I can have an ass uh, show where I don't have all the energy. Same. I wish I had, and she yeah. got it all. Same, and there was a night same. when Louise was <laughs> sick, and she didn't have her voice, and I was like, all right, I'll take it. Here I go. It's just, you know, it's like mm -hmm. a relay, and you've got... A teammate. It's so it's much nicer. So great. And those times when you saw that show that you saw in um, where was it, Rhode Island or Boston? I don't know. It was Providence, actually. Oh, Providence. Yeah. You said that. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, I seem to remember that show. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I, I offer all those shows with that Nina. I, I felt like you know, look to my right and where was she? And there was mm -hmm. this empty spot. You know. Um, or there was some other woman. Um, but no, whose but name she, might have rhymed with Nina. Yeah. <laughs> that was like two weeks long. <laughs> but she, but the, there was there was some dude over there, you know. Right, like, right. Was, like there was not. I had the same experience, totally same experience. It's so much fun to be on stage and look over and see Louise. Yeah. It's so great. No, that it's was so crazy. Great. Like to see that at the, sh I was just so excited. I had, like just gotten back from Asia, so I was super super tired. But I'm like, I can't believe. I was like, this is just wonderful. Like, I was just so happy for you because it's really nice just fun. to see you back together as yeah. friends too, and just happy on stage. Um, totally, happy. everyone. Like, you all just yeah. looked like you were having a good time. Yeah. Um, you know, Jim. Jim said that whole tour. He's like, we have gotten through the hardest parts. Yeah. Like, all we need to do is show up and have a good time. That's mm -hmm. our only job tonight. And so he said it so many times. He would say that every night yeah. before the show. It was like his little pep talk. He's yeah. like, just remember, we just have to have fun. That's all we have to do. Yeah. Um, we don't need to worry about but, anything up there except mm -hmm. having a good time. And so I started saying, Jim, would you say that thing again? <laughs> <laughs> you just say it before every show and yeah. do your power pose. Mm -hmm. um, really? Can I ask you just like a couple feministy yes. Smith questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <laughs> and again, with that, I'm just always so afraid of like offending someone. Um, 
Are you conscious of, uh, because you're on stage and people are staring at you, um, are you conscious of aging in front of people? Um, being an older woman, but not older. What no, are you guys yes, technically? Yes. Middle, what do I don't we know. Like Is it middle age? I don't know what it's called. No, there's some, what did, what do we like to say? Uh, women in our position. Well, I'm deliberately, position. I'm only interviewing people who are over 40 mm -hmm. because I, you know, it's like, <laughs> what kind of perspective do you have as like a 28 right. year old right, or something? Right, right, so right. I don't care. Right. Um, but yeah, just that's something that it doesn't come up in when you're interviewing old male rock stars. I mean, it is different. Like there is a double standard. I think being a musician is a gendered occupation. Like it is just different. I don't know, but I'm just so. Oh what's yeah, your experience no, we do, we do, we feel it, and and um, you know, it, there. The truth is, back in the day, as I said, we enjoyed to a certain extent. We really did enjoy the fun, like oh, we look pretty. That's nice, you know. But really, it all started with music, and it was about music. And it was easy to get sidetracked when you show up at a photo shoot and they've got all these pretty clothes and makeup and blah, blah, blah. and you do, you get kind of derailed. And then, um, but it's still fun. I mean, it was great. Mm -hmm. So now when we do that kind of stuff, you know, it's harder. It's harder. You know, we, we're, we've we always looked at ourselves with a critical lens. Now, you know, I remember my mother saying to me when I was really young, like, you know, and insecure about wearing a bathing suit or whatever it was when I was a teenager and she said enjoy it because you will look back when you were older and you say well I looked amazing why did I care? you know and um and now I you know have a daughter and I would like her to feel great about how she looks at every moment in her life and um I would like that you know I'd like to say oh, it doesn't matter and you shouldn't care and what you look like doesn't matter but we um we played, you know, we did Conan O'Brien, and it was the first time we'd been on television, and it was really hard. This is, you know, yeah. six months ago, whenever that was. And it's really hard not to look at yourself and say, like, oh, my God, you know, whatever it is, to look at yourself in this hypercritical way. And then we had this sort of realization of, like, we are not supermodels. We are... We can be role models. Mm -hmm. um, we were back then, and we can be now. It is not our job to look younger than we are. Mm -hmm. It's not our job to look like models. It is our job to be in our 40s playing music that we love for people that possibly love us, possibly, <laughs> possibly like us, possibly hate us, whatever it is. But it is, it's our job to be artists and to make music. It is not our job. And so it, that is something that I try to come back to whenever I feel myself veering away and feeling insecure and looking at myself with that critical lens. That, that stuff does not matter. It's way more important. You know, you look at Chrissy Hunt or Patti Smith or, mm -hmm. you know, Amy Mann, anyone, you know, who, Joni Mitchell, you know, Joni Mitchell, who's now the face of Yves Saint Laurent. For, oh, is she? Yes, she Did is. Not know that. And Joan Didion is the face of Celine oh. to, to 2015. So, um, I know. So, you, um, you know, every time I feel myself veering away towards the dark side of like, ah, what if. Or I you feel me veering away. Or I feel Louise veering <laughs> oh, away, or yeah. she feels me veering away. We have to remind ourselves that's not, this is, that's not important. It, what is important is that we are not hiding ourselves. We are going out there and playing shows and going on television and looking like women in their 40s look and playing music. That's what it's about. It's about rock and it's about, it's about music yeah. and, and, you know, loving what we do. And so, It's yeah. about lasting songs and... And, yeah. you know, and as I said before, like, making our offering now while we feel it, you know, mm -hmm. and I mean, I was just thinking, you know, one famous musician who has aged beautifully and made music the whole way through, well, two, I can think of Neil Young and David Bowie, um, not of the female variety, you know, the, the songs that they've made over the course of time, it's all in the songs, it's all about mm -hmm. the songs, and they have, people aren't going to be looking at pictures of of Neil Young when they hear a song in the future, like whether it's from when he was in his 40s or 30s or 20s, they're just going to hear a song by Neil Young, you know? Yeah. 
and and know that that re they recognize that voice and um, if they care to look deeper, they can find out what album and what you know and what phase of his career it was. But but in the end, it's it's our voices together that you know that define this band, and it's it's hopefully we have just we're continuing to make songs that matter and songs mm -hmm. that penetrate and and impact people because those are the kind of obviously the music the music that drives us and compels us to make our own music is the stuff that comforted us when we were little and inspired us when we were teenagers and and made us excited us about being artists you know and and made us think that we might be able to do it ourselves one day mm -hmm. and hopefully those are the things that um, we are doing to other people and for other people and will continue to um, you have more you're not on a label right are you releasing everything yourself um, so we we could possibly very soon be on a label Oh, okay. um, yeah, that's it. It's in the works right now, and the reason for that is because we really like the person who runs this label, and because um, we are as moms so busy that we, as much as we like the idea of self-releasing, yeah. we don't have we don't have the time. We need it's someone to keep running consuming. it. Yeah. Um, I need to just check 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 in with my husband because he's called three times, and I'm a little concerned about my daughter. Okay, well we can. Sure. Yeah, I, mean, I can do that, but I do need to check it right now. Cause, sure. Excuse me, because he has called a couple. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so did the age question, mm -hmm. um, and I guess I always ask this question because I'm doing the project after writing that paper, which I hope to turn into an article, just, um, I kind of focused on the 90s by accident, um, and actually focused on those articles that were written about you guys, kind of, but because they pissed me off <laughs> so, so badly, um, and I'm... So I'm doing this project because I just feel like, um, you know, there are women in rock who are adequately represented, and I mean, although they, it's like Women of Rock or the Rolling Stone book Women of Rock, and you have Patti Smith and Debbie Harry and, you know, Courtney Love um, kind of is supposed to represent, like, all women, I, I feel like, who played rock music in the 90s. Like, you have these token women who were supposed to represent everybody else who was playing music during that time. Mm -hmm. There was even uh, one of the articles I read about you guys for my paper said we don't need another Breeders. And it's like, oh, there's already a Breeders. And you sound nothing like the Breeders. Right, right, but it's right. just like that genre of music, you can only have one. Right. Um, and just in general, how do you feel about the, about the representation of women in music in rock music, um, I'm not even talking about, you know, the super famous people like the Courtney Loves and the Patti Smiths, but um, like the people I'm interviewing, um, who I just, it, it's, I noticed that it's hard for me to do research for these interviews because there's not a lot of stuff, there's not a lot of information readily available, which is why I'm doing this. And just your thoughts on that. I am very long-winded. <laughs> I apologize. That was a question. <laughs> that was kind of a question. Um, I feel like there are plenty of us out there. I have the sense that there's more and more. I mean, I know so many 16-year-old girls who can play guitar, like, incredibly well. Um... 16 year old girls who can play drums like people now I feel like girls just pick up guitars and learn to play them really young and get really good and can do you know garage band or their total pro tools and they can record stuff put it out put it up on on the internet like I, I feel like they're, we're all out there mm -hmm. it's it's kind of a question of what gets played it doesn't really matter anymore what gets played on the radio. Yeah. Like, obviously, in the top 40 world, it's going to be the girls that are, you know, possibly less rock, possibly more pop. Um, maybe don't play instruments, but maybe they do. That Maybe they're really excellent piano, piano players. I mean, I feel like there are plenty of women saying really interesting things on in all genres mm -hmm. and now they're all we're all there you know I, right I mean and it's easy to get it all out there and um, I don't think there's a people always come up to me and they'll say like there's nobody doing what you guys did and 
there's nobody, and there is. I mean, mm -hmm. I feel like there really is. There's no, there's no us because we, what we have is unique. But there, there are, I think there are a lot of women playing music everywhere right now, mm -hmm. girls and women, um, in abundance. That's my perception. Um, what about like, um, uh, like, as far as documenting history or something, or like the rock canon? Um, I guess I was thinking about that more, like. And, well, it's kind of hard because now it's not, now you have the internet, so it's not really rock journalism anymore, but right, how women right. are represented in rock journalism or music blogs or how you're written about, how often you're written about, um, in, you know, in comparison to male-fronted bands. Um, I don't know. I don't know that I'm equipped to comment on that. I do feel like, just on a tangent, I suppose, that um, I did feel like when we came back out again, um, I felt like the reception was really positive. There was not a lot of snarky stuff being said about us, at least not that I know of. Yeah. Um, I feel like it's harder now. People don't really criticize as much. Like now oh, yeah. I feel like because it's, all, because it's all out there and I feel like there's this sort of group understanding that we support everybody. Mm -hmm. Like, we're just going to support everybody. No one's going to... Like, I feel like nobody nobody commented on us, you know, being too old to be out there. Like, mm -hmm. back then, they commented on us being, you know, whatever. Not not real, not talented, not whatever. I feel like nobody, yeah. nobody cut us down. Mm -hmm. And I was sort of expecting to be cut down because that's what it was like back then. Yeah, and but it's nobody really, did. I haven't read anything. No. Anything negative no. about your reunion. And I don't know what that's about. I, I don't know whether it's just the the climate is kinder and more accepting. Uh, or, or I don't know. Time will <laughs> tell, right? I mean, yeah, I guess. We'll see when you, when you release your record yeah. or something. I think we'll right. get a real taste of what it's yeah, going to be. Yeah, that's probably true. That's probably true, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think people were you know, happily surprised that we returned and reunited and we're playing shows and... Mm -hmm. It was a very pleasant experience to read all that press, yeah. you know? Yeah. And we'll see, yeah, when our record comes out, you know, what the reception is like and and if there's a similar kind of, um, you know, potential for that kind of backlash that existed back then. But I think Nina's right. I think that, that the climate has changed. Yeah. And um, Like other artists, artists don't really rip on other artists as much as they used to, like... Because you got to be careful because everything's out there immediately. Like back right. in the day, oh, yeah. we would slag everybody. But that was because it would show up in one magazine and it would have to get out via word of mouth. But mm -hmm. like now, I would never really slag anybody yeah. on, you know? Because yeah. then everybody knows and then you're face to, you know, then that person tweets at you and tells you so you just love asshole. everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So because you're so emotionally evolved that you would have no need because you love everyone, right? Right, right, right. right. <laughs> I mean, um, you know, no, no time for all that negativity anymore. Anyway. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, is there anything else that you... I kind of just let people run, <laughs> just run free at the end if there was anything that I... I feel like I've been here for a really long time. I'm going to tell Jen I went well over the two hours. <laughs> yeah. She was yeah. like, you have two hours. <laughs> like, okay, Jen. <laughs> um, but I do always ask uh, people, it's my Oprah question, and sometimes it makes people cry. Your but Oprah question. It's really not that intense. It's just, what are you most, do you have any regrets? Um, what are you most proud of, either personally or professionally, um, as far as your career goes? Yeah. Well, luckily, we've covered the regrets part already. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, I mean, and I, I think we've already talked about this too, but. I'm really proud of me and my friend Nina for for <laughs> getting past our shit and getting back together and doing yeah. this now, you know, and and doing it as mothers, and you know, li really living. I and mean, we are living the dream. We are, <laughs> and and it's not. I mean, it's it's not like we have round the clock nannies and we're living in mansions and all of that <laughs> stuff that one would imagine in Hollywood of the dream of LA or whatever or in the industry. But we are living, what, like the most incredible dream I could have imagined in, 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 in making this album together and in having renewed our friendship and, and our daughters being friends, our mm -hmm. children being friends, and um, having Jim and Steve back in my life is such an incredible gift. 
and to know these people again who were like my family, it's sort of, you know, as a, as a child of a, of a broken family, I think um, I, my biggest dream would be that everyone reunited. You know, mm -hmm. my parents reunited, my family reunited, and we were once together again, and there was a sense of harmony. And that was not meant to happen, but this was apparently meant to happen. And this was another family in my life. And, um, and beyond that, we have families of our own. And so this doesn't carry the weight that, an unnecessary weight, an inappropriate weight that it did back then. Mm -hmm. Now it can be in, in its proper place. And, and we can be musicians and work together and create together and have very fulfilled, happy personal lives that we have cultivated over time with blood, sweat, and tears, and, and love, and and now it's just like a world of abundance. And, you know, Nina and I can craft our futures, you know, together, independently, but we can work towards being songwriters and co-songwriters, because we now know how to do that, and mm -hmm. we're working, we work at that too, for a long time to come. And sort of like, it feels like the world is our oyster, and we can do whatever we want with it right now. and. And as long as we really honor what's been given to us and have gratitude for what's been given to us and what's in our present, we have an abundant future. And I feel like we're at a really, really beautiful juncture and a great place. All right. Well, thank you both very much for, I really do appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to do this. Really thank you for mm -hmm. yeah, including us in this project. You're my favorite ones, but don't tell anyone. <laughs> <The end. laughs>